for coming. Welcome uh, the, 20, the January 22nd, 2019 Select Board meeting is now in session. Thank you. I hope you are all enjoying this weather <laughs> we're having because it's not going to last. Um, <laughs> This evening, we're, we're going to start with uh, the select board and town manager reports. We're mixing things up a little bit. I think we're going to try this for a while. So the select board and town manager will give their reports, and then we'll have public comment. Um, unless one of us has a topic not anticipated 48 hours in advance of the meeting, we'll move on to the discussion of the items in the agenda. These include a board vote on a class one uh, uh, license application. We're going to hear from Emmett Schmarsau, did I pronounce that correct, correctly, of the State of Department, State Department of Elder Affairs. Uh, he will discuss trends around the state for planning needs for a new senior and community center, something I think we all feel is very important. Um, we'll hear, then we'll hear an update from the town accountant. We'll preview the warrant article for April's annual town meeting. <clears throat> we will hear from town council about the use of Memorial Park. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm looking for the for someone, Bill Brown. If he doesn't show for this, uh, I'll, we'll have to send him a copy of the video because he's been asking for that for years. So we'll also hear from the town manager about the process to address the school committee vacancy and the board can discuss that. And then we'll hear updates on the goals of this select board for this year. Uh, so now on to liaison reports. Last week I started to my left. I'll start to my right with Mr. Halsey. I'm actually, um, I have nothing to report tonight. Um, okay. Um, well, yes, so I have a few things to report. I went to the Sierra Club um, Climate Change Summit about a week ago. Um, they're, at the state level, they're discussing a potential fracked gas pipeline um, that would be built possibly in 2020. There's some question as to the benefit or not of that to the state. Um, so if you want more information on that, I suggest you visit sierraclub.org. Uh, um, they emphasize that the future is electric and there's a, so it, the big takeaway for me was that we need to be working closely with RMLD on ways um, to make the community more green. Um, and in line with that, there is actually a state initiative called the Green Communities Division. Um, and they provide grants, um, technical assistance, local support from regional coordinators um, to help municipalities reduce energy use and costs. Um, so Bedford actually has worked towards greening their entire town fleet. Um, so it's actually saving them a bit of money there. Um, so again, another great opportunity to partner with RMLD. At the ZBA meeting on January 16th, there was um, uh, an issue before the board regarding Lincoln Prescott. The building was built um, differing from the original plans. It was off by one foot on one side and two feet on another, meaning it was closer to the sidewalk. Um, this was only this was recently caught by town staff, and the ZBA <coughs> determined that it was considered an insubstantial change. They were asked with whether it was a substantial and substantial change. Um, there was extensive discussion from residents on this, um, and they've raised numerous concerns. The balconies will now overhang from the sidewalks. There is less space for snow removal. There is falling snow and ice concerns for pedestrians, since it's right near the train station especially. Um, and line of sight concerns were also raised. So there's two sides of this. Um, the ZBA side, which is now concluded, uh, and the town's involvement. So I've asked the chair to put this on the agenda for next meeting because there was a lot of resident concern. Um, but it's important to note that that particular agenda item is not about um, the ZBA's actions. It's um, about the town's involvement to this point. Um, and so for those watching that are concerned about that, the select board does not have the authority to change their determinations. Um, 
So I also went to the MMA, Massachusetts Municipal Association annual conference. A lot of great sessions, wonderful networking to hear what other towns are doing, but I'll focus on just one since I know my colleagues went as well. Um, there was one on parliamentary procedures, and this one um, was great. There were several key takeaways here. They emphasized, as our own town council have said, not to follow Robert's <coughs> rules. Um, it's easy to get bogged down with them, and they can be abused. Um, the other big one was regarding public comment. So I learned that the board cannot engage during public comment. It's a violation of open meeting law because those issues are not on the agenda. The most we can do is direct to additional resources or information, um, or we can say we'll consider it for a future agenda. They also suggested defining public comment um, to be limited to only issues that pertain to subjects under our jurisdiction. Um, they also suggested we define rules for participation, including length, uh, the fact there's no derogatory comments, uh, no swearing, et cetera. Um, and they encouraged us to be available outside um, of meetings, but I think most of us do that anyway. Uh, and they also encourage parliamentary training for all board members, especially those that are new, so that everyone operates under the same guidelines. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Barry? Um, so I also attended the ZBA meeting um, with Vanessa, as, as I am a liaison to the ZBA. Um, I am not going to comment on the decision or the appropriateness of the decision because I think that, that um, this board has sort of gotten in trouble in the past when we sort of stray out of our lane. However, um, at that meeting, um, you know, as Vanessa said, there were some questions about um, sort of the, the um, safety and um, uh, safety concerns. So at that meeting, it sort of begged some questions for me. Um, and also, I too, um, I think we're on the same page, I did also request a, an agenda item for our next meeting um, on this. And so for me, the questions really become, um, uh, obviously around this project specifically, um, I want to learn um, what's the process for town inspecting, you know, in this particular foundation before other major work occurred. Um, how is it missed? What's the fact pattern? What's the timeline? Also, what actions can we take um, to deal with some of the concerns that were raised? Specifically, um, there was the overhangs, but also because the building is put out forward, people turning from Prescott Street onto Lincoln Street, you know, is that, um, is that view sort of impinged by that? I, I, I like to know that because to me that's a safety concern. Um, you know, what actions do we take or will we take to enforce what's already in the order of conditions, especially around parking, start times, um, maintenance of the area once they're done, uh, including um, leveraging fines if things if people are out of compliance. Um, what can we do to limit construction parking on that site? Um, it is right by the train station and, and it is uh, a busy time. Um, the other thing that I also want to do, because I think um, really talk about is because this is the first project out of the gate um, and we do have a number of other projects coming f f um, you know coming online um, I noticed that there's a fence around the post office that generally means that there's something going to be happening soon um, they're already moving dirt around at Sunoco station so um, Bob I would like to as part of that agenda item um, just to have perhaps you or Jean talk about do we have the resources to effectively monitor and enforce the projects that already are in the pipeline um, you know, do we have the right resources? Do we, if not, do we need more? What do we need to do that? And then also what I'd like to, to talk about or, or have, and, and, and perhaps this, you know, this might require inviting in our friends at, Z, at ZBA and also CPTC, is there a list of best practices that the town can um, employ? Um, for already permitted projects or new projects coming down the pike so that neighbors have an expectation of sort of what can be expected. Now obviously um, our economic development agenda is incredibly important but also so is the you know so is the, the health and safety and wellness of a lot of the people in the neighborhoods where these projects are going to go are going to be built and so you know we heard from you know there's a, the ZBA voted a certain way we're not going to talk about that but there's a lot of comment from people who say well the building department you know makes me move something when my deck not right. So we need to make sure that people we are playing on a level playing field that, you know, that we have the confidence of folks that we're not just <coughs> turning a blind eye maybe because there's a big project or a developer when we treat neighbors the same way. So those, I know what's going to be on the agenda. Those are the things I'd like to kind of focus on. Um, 
So I also attended the, uh, all, uh, with the we, we, we were well represented uh, in the MMA meeting. Um, I uh, attended a couple of workshops. The ones I uh, attended, I thought that I got the most out of was a, um, a workshop on how to support your downtown businesses. Um, and what was incredible about that is that t um, to a town, Everybody seems to believe and are doing that essentially the way you support your downtown businesses is that you, you, you have people living and working in the downtown. So a lot of the towns that had presented and talked about downtown businesses by having like what we did, 40R, that I thought was really interesting, and I know it kind of, say, it, it kind of li lines up with some of the things we're doing, is that all the towns that presented also have very strong art and cultural organizations that they're employing in the downtown, whether that be theaters, performing arts center, galleries, they've all sort of Employed um, sort of the creative economy to their downtown, and you know we have a, a, a newly formed group, Arts Reading, that's working to uh, to creating a cultural district downtown. Um, that is actually not an outlier. That is something that a lot of towns have, have looked at. So I thought that that was great. That that we're not the only one. Um, the other thing that I want to report on at the MMA, um, I, um, I sort of bumped into by accident um, our lieutenant governor. And when I say bumped into, I mean bumped into. I was reading something that I took away from a table and not looking where I was going and I walked right into her. Um, and so I used that opportunity to kind of talk about Reading and talk about some of the things that we had done in economic development when Jay Ash was here and asked her if she could set up a meeting with sort of the person who's going to replace Jay. And she said, well, you know, he's still kind of getting on board. Would you mind if I come? And I said, uh, I don't think we'd mind, <laughs> Lieutenant Governor, if you come. So she gave us a staff card and invited um, us to call. And, and so I, I think we should think about sort of how we want to entertain the Lieutenant Governor, what we want to show her, and what we, what we want to ask her for, more importantly. Um, uh, the we have to entertain her? Uh, I think if we, I think Nero's, we can get her a cup of coffee. Sorry, Finn. Yeah. And, 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 so so um, the other thing I'm working with uh, Vanessa on, uh, as you recall, in November we did, uh, we set up an ad hoc committee to look at um, creating um, some uh, uh, a human rights advisory board. So we've, um, Vanessa and I have sent out invitations uh, to folks that we're inviting. We're still waiting to hear from a couple of people. Um, I think by our next meeting, Vanessa, I think we can safely say that we'll be able to announce who's on the committee and perhaps have a first meeting scheduled. So I just didn't want people to think about, um, you know, that that fell down by the wayside. Um, also, um, many of us attended the Martin Luther annual Martin Luther King ceremony yesterday um, at the high school. Um, incredible job by HRAC um, in setting up this um, uh, this wonderful event. Um, there was um, there were poems and songs and and singing and just it was very inspirational. The fact that it was nine degrees did not impact the crowd. There was still a ton of people there, and it was a great turnout. And finally, Mr. Chair, um, I want to. I want to give a shout out and a recognition to one of our residents, um, Teresa Wiggins, who is the owner of Village Parenting. Um, Teresa has volunteered um, uh, her own time to basically um, have parents or, or caregivers of children sign a, caregiver, sign a caregiver pledge. And that basically the pledge states that they will talk to their children about inclusion, um, about acceptance, and, and then when they sign the pledge, um, she is going to basically um, provide a ton of resources to help people have those conversations with their children. Um, remember, the Reading Public Schools do a tremendous job in sort of in, in their curriculum, but let's face it, the kids don't get there till they're five years old, and they're only there seven hours a day. It really begins at home, and a lot of people want to have these conversations with their kids, but they just don't know where to start. So Teresa, through Village Parenting, um, has provided a whole level of, of resources is to help people guide those conversations with their kids, young kids, and there's a list of books that, that, that can be read from young kids all the way up to high school. Um, the way you'll access that, um, Village Parenting on Facebook, you'll see the Caregiver Pledge. I think well over 100 parents or uh, caregivers have signed it, um, the more the merrier, because I think that you know as we struggle through some of these issues, and we're going to have the ad hoc committee, we really this stuff really begins at home. And um, so I want to just thank her for doing that. Um, she's not charging any money for this, but it's a great resource, and I want to encourage people to look that up. And, and if you have kids that you're caring for in Reading, you know, please consider signing that pledge. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Um,
Vanessa just indicated she forgot one Thank thing. You. I have one more. Um, Barry, thanks for bringing that up. I think it's a wonderful idea. I signed it and committed to talking to my kids about it, so I, uh, thank you for recognizing her. Um, one of the things I uh, that recently came up um, that, that we've all presumably been following is the government shutdown, and we've been hearing stories about how there are members of the community that are, that are struggling during this time. Um, so is it possible, I know that there's precedent, for us to um, create a program <coughs> whereby residents who are furloughed or contractors of the federal government be granted leniency in paying local bills, whether, it, whether it's water or um, property taxes, uh, perhaps partnering with RMLD. Um, I know it's not on the agenda, it could fall under 48 hours, but I, I wanted to mention that there's yeah. numerous private organizations and nonprofits that are working to help these individuals, um, but I think this would be a nice way to help those in our community that are struggling with this right now. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, Obviously, we can't discuss that, but this meeting, but, but we can, um, you can talk with Bob. Yeah, I was going to say, I'll connect with Bob. But. And perhaps that's a, that's a nice thing. So um, just uh, for the chair report, I wanted to let you all know and be open uh, about the fact that uh, both Barry and I have been sp speaking with the chair and vice chair of the school committee uh, and Bob educating ourselves uh, on the process of uh, replacing uh, the school vacancy left by Sherry Vandenacker. Uh, the, those uh, the conversations were very um, uh, friendly, pleasant, and uh, I personally learned a lot about the process, which we will discuss, which Bob's going to go over uh, later this evening. Uh, I, too, on Friday and Saturday attended the MMA's annual meeting in Boston. It's my first one, and I have to tell you, I, I was a little hesitant to go. Um, I went, and it was fantastic. Um, they really presented some sessions that are at the forefront of innovative ideas to help towns and cities. Uh, <clears throat> and they're a resource that I think we could use more often. The sessions, I just want to list four of the sessions that I, I went to. <clears throat> and each one sort of generated some ideas that I thought might be helpful and useful for the town of Reading. The first one was about the opioid, exodemic, opioid epidemic. And it, it was um, gripping, to, to say the least. Um, a doctor from Western Massachusetts presented on the opioid epidemic, epidemic things you can do for as preventative measures, but also uh, focusing on recovery and things that are needed for recovery. And so on this topic, I hope to share the information with John. You're still our liaison to our CASA. Oh, yeah. And Board meeting this week. Yep. And uh, meet with uh, Eric and Matt. Maybe the three of us could. We could meet with Eric and McNamara, and I could just sort of a brain dump on, on what I learned. Uh, ha then there was a session on how to use zoning to encourage aging in place, um, which was very interesting. And I'll talk to Bob about, um, and, and perhaps the, the bylaw committee, um, about what I learned there. The third one was how to save money when buying supplies and services. Now that sounds very boring, but um, I found it, it turned out to be pretty, pretty interesting. There was some good advice. I assume Bob's probably doing all this already, but um, it, it never hurts to share uh, what I've learned there. And then the last one was tips for building age-friendly communities. And all, all of this stuff screams for a community um, center, uh, age center to bring the gen uh, uh, elder center to bring the youth and uh, elders of the community together more. Um, so I'll be discussing that more with Bob and um, the Council on Aging and, and all the key players there. Um, <clears throat> so, yesterday morning, I, like Barry and uh, Vanessa, attended the MLK celebration of the high school. I won't repeat what they said, but uh, the music was fantastic. 
and they had quotes from uh, Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King throughout the program, which, which were very inspiring. Um, lastly, as the board's liaison to the Lincoln Prescott Street site, I learned that um, there's, there continues to be this problem of construction worker vehicles parking on the street, which is in violation of the ZBA permit. And uh, many of you may know that, that I've been um, w working on this uh, since the summertime um, and uh, hope to make some more progress. Uh, in, in the in the t time to come, um, I've al also been working on uh, this with the assistant town manager and Ms. Alvarado. Because um, why am I calling people by the Ms. <laughs> with Vanessa and um, and who's uh, the, the liaison to our police and the ZBA. So it's a, it's a good fit. You have the liaison to the development, liaison to ZBA and their permit, and the police. Um, I've also reached out again to one of the developers to see when they can get a sign up to notify Reading residents about next day street closures um, so that residents can plan uh, for a, a, a street closure during rush hour. Um, I'd like to ask the rest of the board if they think it would be helpful at this point um, to invite the developers and construction company to our next board meeting to discuss the ongoing concerns of our constituents, or if you think we should just keep working uh, uh, working right out of the way that we have been doing. So. Um, that's a, a, a question about an agenda, which we can, chew, you can we can chew on during the meeting, and at the end of the meeting we can see whether it would be a good idea or not. Um, okay. Okay. So uh, I, I, I'm not. I'm asking you because I'm, I don't really feel uh, strongly about it yet. Um, so now over to Bob for the town manager. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll try to be quick. Uh, first, to talk about the snow. I understand now why old people like Florida. I always wondered when I was a kid. <laughs> um, we used uh, 600 tons of salt over the weekend. It seemed like an awful lot to me. Um, one of the real challenges that the weather presented, um, and probably all of us as homeowners ran into the same issue, is the forecast and what really happened were quite different and constantly changed. Um, on Sunday morning, the forecast was it would start to rain, which it did, and it would go into the 40s. Instead, it plunged down to 15. Don't know why. So one of the challenges the town had in doing its snow removal was it had done a first pass. It had started to do the second pass and get right down to pavement on the main roads, which it did. Normally, it would then jump to the side streets to clean them up, but the main roads started to freeze and cards started to slip off them. So they had to suddenly retool, go down to the garage and get all the sand and, and more ice, uh, uh, more salt out. So that took an enormous amount of time to make the main road safe before they could even get to the side street. So that was one of the challenges was really just the volatility uh, in the weather. Um, I have to be very thankful and appreciative that more than any storm I can remember, we got more thank yous from residents. We got a few complaints, um, but we got more thank yous and that really means a lot because um, for folks that don't know, the same crew was out there the whole time. We don't have backup crews and nighttime crews. Um, during the weekend, there were three water main breaks. The same people that plow snow go out and fix water mains, which is another interruption to the snow. So it, it really does mean a lot after someone's worked for 30 hours in a row to get a thank you. Um, and I really do appreciate that. Um, for those that don't know, we had an active fire on Temple Street today right across from Parker. Um, there were no injuries. There was some damage. Uh, certainly it was in a rear deck. Um, it was a three alarm fire. In addition to thanking um, the Reading Public Safety Departments for being out in very difficult conditions, uh, fire crews from Wakefield, Woburn, Wilmington, Stone, and Burlington, Linfield, and Melrose also responded. Wow. And just so you're aware, they don't necessarily all come to the scene, but they have. we have two fire stations that need to be backed up um, if all our firefighters are on a scene. So I know that was a very tough condition. You can only imagine how cold it was. Um, you know, as, as again, as I have heard, there were no injuries. A lot of streets were closed. They're reopened now. Um, the issue of furloughed federal workers did come up late last week. 
so I can <coughs> talk about it from my perspective and do directly. Um, and I'll just leave one to details if you wish at another meeting. Um, I have heard that there are four local banks who are very interested and in already offering programs to help if you're a customer of theirs. So for any of the furloughed workers that are having any kind of financial difficulty, paying a property tax bill, whatever it is, the banks are working with them. And I got a list of the four, and I got it secondhand, so I really feel more comfortable not mentioning names, but it's four of the largest banks in town. I met uh, briefly last week with Senator Lewis and a couple of members of his staff. Um, he thought the meeting where the, uh, the group came in and met the select board was really worthwhile and would like to do it again next fall. Mm. Um, so we'll just throw, throw that out for now. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to remind the board, you're posted uh, four times in the next week or so for various things. Thursday the 24th, you're posted at 7 o'clock for a school committee uh, budget meeting. Um, on the 28th, Monday at 7.30 a.m., uh, Vanessa and John Halsey are posted as a Capitol and Oakland Road, two different subcommittees to meet with me. Uh, that night at 7 o'clock at night, um, you're posted again to attend a school committee budget meeting. And then on the 31st, uh, Andy and Dan are both, uh, both posted at 7 o'clock, that's a Thursday, I believe, to um, meet as a policy subcommittee again with me. So yeah. your four meetings are that, posted. That date may change. I got a different date okay. from, from Dan, but okay. we'll, we'll get that out. Yeah. And uh, that's it. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you for your availability on all those subcommittee meetings. Certainly. Yeah. Uh, it's just at 7 in the morning. Ours is uh, at 7.30. You, um, <laughs> just oh. Yes, John. Um, I just, um, in, in light of, I kind of slipped out of my, you know, out of my mind, but um, I, I normally um, make a run to the Boston Food Bank, bringing things back here, and I was advised by the people that run the Boston Food Bank relative to government employees. Should they have any need, all they need to do is stop in. Um, the food bank is prepared to help them. Mm -hmm. um, won't be necessary for the normal process that uh, people would go through to be able to register and utilize it um, given the circumstances they feel like they're in a good spot to help you know any of any reading residents who yeah um is affected by the government shutdown and are happy to help food bank so I, I i wanted to say that out loud and you know on tv and um yeah. make sure that it's clear that um uh, they're quite happy to help and accommodate anybody's needs in that regard so so the question is how, how can we get the word out i, I know there will be a huge viewer viewership for this meeting but um you know how can we amplify what you just said well you know i'm guessing that's something that uh, we've got the media here um, yeah and you know they can that can be a quick posting yeah. public service posting Great. in the papers and um and I'm sure that the patch would be, even though I know he's busy tonight in Stoneham, he's covering a lot of different towns. Yeah. Um, I can make a quick call to him and let him know, and it'll get it. We'll get it posted, you know, quickly. Then, I think so. I I, have, well, I think that's a great idea. Is this something that we can, we as the town can list, create a list of the various services that are available here locally? If it's the food bank, if it's the local banks that are doing it, if we can confirm those. Um, and add that on our website so that should people come looking for assistance from the town, there's a snapshot view of what, and then it's up to them to reach out more broadly for specific resources. Yeah, we could certainly post what we know, but I'm not sure what we know is going to be thorough. We'll do the best we can. Yeah. Right. We can add that disclaimer. That's okay. All right. Thank you. We, we should probably move on because we're already behind schedule. Um, <coughs> If uh, so, that now we're entering public comment. Uh, if how many people would like to speak this evening? If we're going to see a rate, or, okay, so um, just be you know, just comments to the entire board, uh, from what we've learned through Vanessa. Um, we will remain steely eyed and silent. <laughs> you could say thank you, yeah, but, but we, we will probably say thank you and. If you bring up something that's within our jurisdiction that we plan to discuss this evening, um, I'll, I'll, I'll just mention we're going to discuss that later, and I hope you can join us for that. So, with that, public comment. <laughs> yes, Nancy. Nancy Doctor, uh, Street. Um, 
for the agenda item, the State Department of Elder Affairs. Um, when you do discuss it, could you please clarify for me whether or not that person was invited by the town, by the select board, mm -hmm. or by both? And the other um, comment, as, as I mentioned last month, I'm going to mention again this month, that the select board owns pesticide regulations, and they've owned them since the middle of 2017. It's now 2019. I would hate to see another spring come without the regulations um, put into effect. <coughs> um, our former town tree warden, uh, Keating um, actually discouraged uh, any testing written into the regulations because of the half-life of certain compounds and pesticides. I'm not an expert on that, but he was. So I would again just urge you to um, act on your regulations. Thank you. I'm biting my tongue because I'm the, the liaison to the Board of Health, but uh, thank you for your comments. Anyone else? Yeah, Angela. Yeah, oh, couldn't see, couldn't see your hand. Angela. Thank you, Angela Benda, 10 Orchard Park Drive. I know it's all trying to edit them to be quick. Um, as ten annual time meeting is approaching, warrant articles and <coughs> projects are being discussed. I'm here to add a few comments um, about uh, discussions regarding the Birch Meadow Master Plan and pro proposed possible pro proposed failed lighting. At the December 4th, 2018 Select Board meeting, Jean Delius made a presentation on the Recreation Department and showed how revenues have increased steadily over the years. What wasn't shown in that presentation was um, financial information showing that expenses have also increased over the years at about the same rate. Uh, I have information from a public records request and, and spreadsheets that I got from Chair Nangstrom. The final amount transferred to free cash from the Recreation Revolving Fund has been about $125,000 as was stated at the meeting. However, this money has historically been used to offset recreation wages, permit staff not paid for through the revolving fund. And I'll just read from the last town warrant that says recreation division, <coughs> expenses are self-funded by fees that utilize a revolving fund and are not part of this budget. Wages as shown below are part of the general fund budget, but a surplus of fees at year end typically repays all or most of the funds to the, most of these funds to the general fund. I went back through warrants. That is generally what is said that uh, excess funds go back to offset um, permanent staff. The final amount um, in 2016, there was approximately $4,000 turned over to free cash that did not offset the recreation staff. In 2018, that number was about 17000 and the town does stay in annual budgets and elsewhere that the recreation department is self-funding and it has relied upon this transfer of funds to do so. Several scenarios were given at town meeting in 2014 to give an idea of what increased usage for field lights and the increased fees might yield to the town. And I'll read this from the April 2015 report, the um, warrant. It says, from a cost standpoint, it should be noted up front that the recreation is not a profit-seeking enterprise. Revolving funds are meant to draw on just enough revenue to reasonably pay for cost. Recreation expenses are paid directly by the revolving fund during the year and fiscal year end. Um, they were at that time returning about seventy-five to one hundred thousand dollars to the general fund in amount purposefully below remaining wages and benefit costs to the town. On the financial side, selling project debt for 10 years will add approximate interest cost. The addition of field available increased field hours purchased by at least 15%. The Recreation Committee has already discussed the raising fees to help this. It is not difficult to see that the project, this project paying for the extra $15,000 cost described above. And so, so the, the uh, estimate varied slightly on how much the fees would go up, how much participation, but $15,000 increased revenue was about what was estimated for that. 
A narrative has been put forth, it was put forth in 2014, and it's been put forth again, that the field lighting project <coughs> would pay for itself in 10 years, uh, in 10 years. Um, and it was even stated the 2000, the December 4th meeting, that it could pay for itself in seven or eight years. There is, to my knowledge, no scenario that has been put forth in writing by the town where the cost of spending $1.4 million on the field lighting would be recovered in 10 years for seven or eight, as was suggested verbally at the December 4th meeting. Citizens of Reading just voted for a $4.3 million override, and while 5% of the override was earmarked for capital projects, which is about $215,000, Neighbors and friends I've spoken to have been surprised to hear that the money, the override money, might be used for the field lighting project. Most importantly, this project needs to be considered along with other deferred projects, other recreational needs, the elementary <coughs> school project and the proposed senior center, and the financial information about it needs to be transparent and complete. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Uh, oh, yes, hi. Hi, regarding concerns. Oh, your name. Jean Thomas, it's yeah. Arlington Street. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding concerns for what has been called Lincoln Prescott, I have concerns which I will be deferring until next week. Thank you for that opportunity. I just um, like to note that the proper name as the developer puts forward is the Metropolitan at Reading Station, a luxury apartment building. So that rather than Reading Village, that we acknowledge it's truly the Metropolitan at Reading Station. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. <coughs> Yes, in the back. Mr. Chairman, Tony DeResel, 130 John Street. I, I'm a little confused right now. Will there be possibility for public comment later on in the evening relating to each discussion option uh, item, or should all public comments be done now? Um, I, I think um, there's many ways to do this, but but I've uh, previous chair have encouraged me to have the comments done now. Um, but but I'll, I'll um, go with the feel of the board on this when we get to those, well, those topics. But, but state it now. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, my concern is about the even on Simmons Way. Mm -hmm. uh, reading through the document, it looks like we would be selling the even for one dollar. It seems to make no sense to me for the town to take a valuable asset and just sell it for a dollar when the uh, petitioner is looking to make 1.3 million. Mm -hmm. And I would say that some sort of remuneration should be paid to the town for the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Anyone else? Seeing none, um, we will um, get right into the class one application. Bob. Thanks. I'll turn it right over to Brad. Thank you. My name is Brad Latham. I'm the attorney here on behalf of Prime Motors 128. Uh, we're filed an application for a Class 1 license for the sale of new motor vehicles. This is the uh, location 8898 Walkersbrook Drive, the current location of the Honda facility. There's no physical change being proposed as a consequence. As you see, I'm here with Chairman Russell, who is uh, Associate General Counsel uh, of Prime Motors. Uh, David Rosenberg cannot be here himself. He's the manager of the facility. The primary activity is, of course, a new sale of license, even though these vehicles are sold as part of that activity. Uh, the company has provided, as required by law in its application, a copy of the workers' compensation, a certificate of insurance coverage. One of the requirements is we show that we have either available on site a complete repair facility or a access to a repair facility. There is one there now and that will continue. It functions well. It is quite adequate. <clears throat> no physical changes are being proposed to the facility itself. It's really just a change of the ownership and management. I also provided 
uh, to uh, the town manager a copy of the dealership license uh, agreement with uh, Honda American Honda Motor Company. Uh, that would be signed when and if a class one license is issued. I also provided a copy of a, license, of a lease to Joe Site Control and a letter of intent dealing with that site control. So the facility is available. Uh, I provided to Prime Motors a copy of the Board of Health Lubrication Oil Regulations, and they're aware of that, will abide by that. Also, a copy of the Select Board's automobile sale policies, they'll also abide by that, so they're, they're fully conversant in those requirements. Uh, we're, we're more than happy to any questions you may have. We think we've, by submissions, uh, met the requirements uh, required by statute. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Bob. And just to comment on the town side, um, the town has reviewed all of Brad's submissions. Uh, they're in order, as, as he pointed out, I think one of the keys is there's no physical changes. So our focus was more on the personnel and the public safety has cleared all that. So mm -hmm. we see no reason the license application shouldn't be approved. Thank you. Barry, did Actually, you no, I'm good. You're good. Okay. Um, I have a motion. You have a motion? Move that the select board approve the new class one license as presented. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? 4-0. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next. Um, Gene will come up and introduce. Okay. Oh, and um, to answer an earlier question from the during public comment, um, the, board, the board did not invite um, uh, the State Department of Elders Affairs to, to come visit. They were so how they, how did they get it? How, how <laughs> I, I believe they invited themselves. Uh, they invited, yeah. Okay. Yeah. They, they offered. Yes. Okay. 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 Good evening, Jean Delios, Assistant Town Manager. I'm very pleased tonight to um, have, <coughs> excuse me, Jane Burns with me. She's the Human and Elder Services uh, Administrator. And Jane and I, together with other staff and public services, have been working for several months now on a number of things related to both the Senior Center and the broader question of whether or not we need a uh, some other type of facility to meet the needs of both the seniors and uh, the youth of the town. And I've been working very closely with Jenna Fiorente, the um, recreation administrator, and we've gone around to a few different towns and looked at different models. Um, so we've been working on this for a while. It is a goal, one of the identified goals that this board passed back in December. Uh, to explore the possibility of a combined center. And so as Jane and I were uh, meeting and discussing this, we thought a logical next step would be to invite um, someone from the state. Our community partner is uh, Emmett Schmarzo. Emmett is the program manager for Councils on Aging and Senior Centers at the Massachusetts Executive Office of Elder Affairs. And so we're very pleased to have Emmett here tonight to share with us his experience and expertise in this area. And so I'd just like to welcome him and ask him to come on up. Thank you. Thank you. Should I stand or you, whatever you I, I prefer, your, I your prefer your stand at work, so I'll just. <laughs> All right, that's fine. Have a seat. Have a seat. Um, thank you. Um, I work with Councils on Aging, a uh, background actually of environmental design in grad school. I did uh, research with uh, elders in Rensselaer County, New York. And I was lucky enough to find a job with the Commonwealth because it turns out that when I actually left grad school, virtually nobody knew what elders were. Um, so it was fairly easy to get a job because nobody had been doing any research on elders. So it was good. So that was 43 years ago. And since then, I have watched communities grow, change, become what they want to be, but what they don't, what we don't know, what I'm in the business of, is this little chart here. And I've got some extras here. Um, I guess that's everybody at the front can, can have, and others, if you're interested. Um, this is a chart I give to people when I do training. I do a lot of board training, I do grant training. I've done it dozens and dozens of times all around the Commonwealth. And why I'm presenting this, and this debate is in particular because the concern about uh, seniors, you know, kids. Well, the issue here 
that you can't see necessarily very well, and I humbly apologize, but basically, when we take the 2010 to 2030 census, okay, this is a very important thing because the boomers became boomers of age, and I am one of them. So what happens here, why this is important is because you've got to look at the community, what it's going to look like basically in 2030, 2040, 2050. It sounds like, oh, it's a long time away. And I think it's like tomorrow. It's the way I do things. So what happens here is the under 20 population during 2010 to 20, 2030, we had a growth of maybe 30,000 in the Commonwealth. That's all, okay? And then the next group, the 20 to 39, same period, maybe 5,000, maybe level. So, so far, so far we've covered under 20 to f under 40, we've got virtually, you know, a, this minuscule population. So the next one is 40 to 59. What does this show? It drops 300,000 people in this time frame. Those people were born, the boomers, etc. The Massachusetts lost 300,000 people of that age group. Okay. Excuse, excuse yes. me. I just want to clarify. Yeah. You say we've lost it. In the uh, decrease. But but the loss hasn't happened yet. Well, this is this is this is where it's going to be. That, right. Of course, we're moving towards. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, the next next but the green box the, the increase 60 to 79 let's hear it for 60 okay in this in this group and at least an increase of 80 plus so what does this mean well when i when i try to do this at presenting i let other people talk and i normally talk for two and a half hours straight so i just want you to know in advance i don't have that time but but basically you know who is going to do the caregiving that's the biggest message I'm probably going to give you tonight. My mother died from Alzheimer's. I looked at who did the caregiving. My father nearly died taking care of her. So was she, did she go to a senior center? Sure did. And as long as she was able to be reasonably capable, then she had to be at home. It was, it was the stress that would kill my father, to be perfectly honest. This is not one story. There are dozens of them. Who is, in effect, going to be taking care of people in the community? So when you're looking at a senior center, now, a senior center, it's, I mean, I want to say it's a home away from home. Because people go to senior centers because it is a home away from home. That most people will say they go to the senior center because there are people who understand what circumstance I'm in. Are they going to cut? They've got a, a, a wonderful tour of the, of the senior center up there. The last time I was here was probably 30 years ago. I, I, at least I knew it was a senior. It was <laughs> I knew what it was then. I didn't know what it was now. It's a phenomenal thing. Every single senior center in Massachusetts, I've been in virtually all of them, is too small. There is only one town in Massachusetts that has a f senior center that will actually last through this time period. That's um, I, I'm Western Mass, town of Irving, and they built 6,000 square feet for 400 seniors. Wow. That is the only one in the state that actually will be built for when, what this time period is. What we're looking at now is a population growth. It's us, you know, people who are in, in, basically baby boomers. Through 2030, it's going to grow. It's not going to drop at all, barring something weird happening. That's it, the story. So why did I bring this up? Who's, what are you going to do in a senior center? Well, is it a home away from home? I think a lot of people would say it. Do you want to have supportive day? Now, I know some of the report earlier talked about mental health, physical. Mental health is sort of like if you're taking care of somebody and your stress is unbelievable, you're going to need a place to be de-stressed, which is why maybe when you go to a senior center, you have supportive day programs. If you were to go to, say, uh, Peabody, that they were one of the cities that did it first you know, a long time ago. And then when they, they added, their, their, their building was originally, I think, 32,000 square feet for 8,500 seniors. You can do the math about how many it is per senior okay, that works. And then they built about maybe four years ago room to have another for 20 people to come. 
and, and in one site, and you're talking about what's called supportive day care and adult day care. You can forget all this stuff, but just simply to say, supportive day means you have come in there and it's somebody who's just there and you do you know, different kinds of things that go in a senior center. People want exercise, they like to do that. If it's adult day, it's a medical model, meaning there's a nurse. Other than that, there's no real difference. I'm simply saying is, when you are stressed, the stress of caregiving is phenomenal. I don't, maybe I should show, show of hands, when, you, when you have, you've done the caregiving, you say, Where, where's my break? And the answer is, there isn't one. Right? So you, when you're looking at a senior center, it's really what do you want, how do you want to have the, the senior, how will the community really look to you? Because you're going to need that support. It's like a speech, but I'm sorry. That's what that's what it is. Okay, I, I'm going to try to be real brief. I love this thing. It's happened in Western Mass years ago. I'll read it. It says, "Judy, do you see that elderly couple down at the other end of the counter?" And she looks this way, and she says, "Yeah, what about them?" And he says. I was just thinking, that's probably what you or I will look like about 10 years from now. And she turns back to him and says, you do realize that's a mirror at the other end of the counter? <laughs> right? Because this is what it looks like. And, and um, so of, of the things, I, 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 I'm glad to be here, but it, normally I'm not somebody who gets into design. I'm going to somebody who says, look, these are the issues. I'm going to go look at the bigger issues. Um, I will say this, I, I don't mind being, it's not a matter of being blunt, it's like there are no senior centers in the Commonwealth that have a youth programs other than perhaps maybe at a holiday in a, with a sing-along. It doesn't happen. Elders do not want to go where kids are. I'm sorry, I'm telling you that. You can think all the other mean things that I might be a part of my life, but it doesn't happen. If you were to go, as I did, well, this is about 15 years, the town of Belmont, it took them 40 years to build a senior center. I'm not making this up. And I went to the meeting Sunday, 300 people showing up, no press. No, I no press, because the town didn't want it. But 300 seniors showed up, right? So what happens is, is that you have now got a situation in which people have made it clear, we don't want our grandchildren, we already raised them. We already in, 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 that's it. So I know you're thinking about it as, as, as it was introduced before. It isn't happening anywhere in Massachusetts. I just want to say it. I don't want to say, like, you're wrong. I'm going to simply say, once you visit four or five centers, I'd be happy to recommend them. I brought some similar size. I got some good data and stuff. But you just talk to them. You're not going to see your kids there. OK. Other things along this way. Um, the demographics, I don't want to drive you nuts on the demographics. Um, I really have, I, I had some material, and I do have the material here, which I was working on today at work. Our office was closed, theoretically, because there was no heat. It still didn't seem warm enough to me, but whatever. Um, what I would like to say is that I would love, to, I'd love to recommend if there are people, four or five or six people, whether on the COA board or something, you know, I, I think the COA board probably is a really good thing, to simply say, let's go to a handful of senior centers. I, I'd be delighted to recommend them. There are some that are virtually identical in size, uh, in fact, to yours. And um, Walpole, uh, two weeks ago, this is interesting, they're almost identical. There's six seniors different from the, from the last 2010 census. So the, the place holds 100, 300 people showed up. Okay? And, and it, it, it turns out that when they were in formerly, which was a, uh, which was a school cafeteria, those kind of thing. So they went from 30 a day to 130 a day in two weeks, every day. It's like, this is, people want opportunity. And when you build a place like theirs, which is just open and I get half a dozen people go to there and say, what are we doing here? Well, among other things, now I noticed there is a, a computer, small computer lab, but you know, I went to another place in Milton, I used to live in Milton, and, and there were 25 people who come, and after a while, and nobody started coming, right? So it's like, when, so what, what are people gonna do when they come to a senior center? I'm going to tell you one thing that you won't pick up on the stats readily, and that is this. People like fitness stuff. 
They really do. They want to do something, whether it's, it's aerobics, whether it doesn't matter. Because people will go, people who engage in fitness are five, more than five times as likely to become volunteers. That's really important because you're going to need volunteers because you're not going to have the money for the staff. Just take my word for this thing, okay? But people want those opportunities. And whatever it is, if you view a senior center as a place of opportunity, it's not a community center. We tried that. I used to work community center when I was in high school doing stuff in Dartmouth, Mass. It's like, it's around there, but somebody has to own it. If you don't own it, it doesn't happen. If somebody doesn't believe in it, it doesn't happen. I'm giving you the common sense things. I've been at this for a long time. I'm not bragging about it. I'm simply saying that's what it is. Okay. Um, so in, in terms of in terms of what to say, I, 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 I'm very willing to keep keep my comments brief about uh, about this. But I would say this: you get half a dozen people who go. I'd be happy to name centers that are all virtually identical. I know one of them. You were looking at uh, Natick, right? We'll look at Needham, almost identical. Here's two of them, and say what works, what doesn't work. And Needham and uh, Natick put in this large thing. It's like a 16 mile, a six, one sixteenth mile track around there. But you know what? It's like that's the kid. That, I mean. The seniors might be walking on it, which is nice, but you don't you don't mix people. People want to feel that they go into the senior center, and it's like they're there with people who they love and know or respect or just appreciate. That's what happens because it is a home away from home, and it does not it has nothing to do with aging. It has everything to do with understanding and opportunities. And I think the business of, of providing opportunities, which is what we underwrite at Elder Affairs, that's the program I oversee for 350 cities and towns. It's like, we help underwrite that stuff. Are we covering ukuleles? No. Are we covering a whole lot of other things? Yes. But that means but it's, it's really your, your town making decisions. And uh, I love being in a position to give other people money and, 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 and give, give credit to the other people, because that's, that's just fine. Cause, but I get to see all the proposals, so that's pretty cool. Um, so I, I, I really do want to keep it brief only, but I've been more than happy to, I mean, I, could, I really can talk for a long time, but I simply want to make it clear that somebody's got to own it, somebody's got to believe in it. It's not, yeah, whether it's going to be in town, I don't know. But I will tell you this, people will drive, they'll drive anywhere. You go, anybody here familiar with Duplicate Bridge by any chance? Anybody know? All right, yeah. hey, that's good, okay. In the town of Freetown, there are 60 people who show up every other week to do duplicate bridge. In Freetown, does anybody know where Freetown is? Oh, never. Oh, a couple people, that's good. But I mean, the point is, if it's got something that interests people, they go, and that's why 60 people every other week go to Freetown. I wouldn't think of it, but my father was a, a bridge player, and that's how I know that people were doing it. So people will go where it meets their needs, and if it means following a fitness instructor from town A to town B to town C, because she's a good, or he's a good instructor, they'll do it. They will go where it meets their needs. So you might be thinking of putting stuff with Chester. Oh, so I, I mean, keep going. Yeah, right. no, this is great. I could listen all night. Um, so um, a, a couple of things. Um, we can't be the only town struggling with this. So oh, every town. Is. Every town is struggling. Yeah. So we've looked at opportunities, like for one of the, an example we're looking at in terms of uh, partnering with other towns on maybe, um, you know, a, D, a DPW garage. Do you know of any efforts in town where, because uh, you, 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 you know, you've been to every single one of them. Have there been efforts or discussions about, because I don't think we can, you know, a 6,000 square foot facility in Reading when Wakefield is struggling with the same thing. Have you seen any efforts where towns have gotten together and just said, you know what, we have the same demographic, we have the same issues, let's all pitch in, build one, because you said people will travel. Or maybe people will build a couple of different ones, but the Reading one deals with fitness, the Wakefield one, you know, where you kind of, where you'll have maybe where, where it's spread out. Or we if you vote to the town, because uh, I really get the whole reports from all the towns, right? It turns out that in the city of Weymouth, the city known as the, the, the town known as the city of Weymouth, or city known as town of Weymouth, they keep playing around with it. 
they had 28 different communities come to the senior center for their programs. 28 recorded, right? And it's like, because one place has it, they're gonna go where people have, because to what I said two minutes ago, somebody has to own it, because you're gonna go into the center and say, look, we're really gonna, we're gonna have great stuff with, with art. Yeah, and they've got a nice little, nice little place, little, but I mean, they might go there for the art, but they're gonna go to some other place, because as long as they can drive, they'll go. So I don't, I don't see this as, there's none of that, that doesn't exist. Uh, well, I will say the closest that came to it when I mentioned the town of Irving before, it's because the other towns have nothing, right. so they are coming to the town of Irving. But in terms of doing town of Deerfield, we, we got an agreement with them, Deerfield, send them away, we do this stuff on Western Mass. But the real small towns with three or 400 seniors, they'll, they'll travel if they can and they will. Yeah. Yes, sir. I I um, I heard at this MMA conference that I, that I went to that um, one branch of state government w will give out um, grants for um, um, sort of uh, preparation and design, if you will, of of the senior center. Um, get mm. getting. Um, Getting really things mean, up and running. Did, did, yeah, doing DHCD may have helped to underwrite stuff a long yeah, time ago, yeah. but wow. So, yeah. so I, I might, I might have gotten the exact purpose of the funding. Uh, right. I might not have nailed that, but it's there, and it helps. It would help Randy get started if, if we could apply it for that. You mentioned that you um, like giving money out to people. Um, it's somebody else's money. I mean, it's somebody else's money. But, but do you? What programs do you fund? Uh, just about any. Most of the money goes out. What's called a formula grant basis, based on your population. Uh -huh. So basically, as long as it's not illegal, immoral, or fattening, we basically will do it. You know? <laughs> but we just we just watch out for things that we don't think are uh, you know, don't represent you know effective use of public money. So that's what I. So, so could you give some examples of, of, of grants that you've uh, awarded? Well, the ones, the, the formula grants is all you're deciding, it's community deciding. All I'm doing is making sure that it's, it's a reasonable public purpose. Mm -hmm. The other things are the, what's called service incentive grants, but they're, for instance, one of the things that's happened a lot lately, you may not know this, but well, you probably are aware, the, the Alzheimer's, there's a whole lot of communities that are now doing stuff with Alzheimer's that wasn't happening like three years ago. It was not happening. The secretary who just left, sadly, she's brilliant. I really do mean brilliant. Um, she just, she can't be 16 places at once um, but the Alzheimer's stuff has really really become important I mentioned earlier about my own, my own mother but it's like having that is a place where you get you can get de-stressed as a caregiver that's got to happen and it's, you're going to need it in virtually every town now, I'm not going to say sometimes you're going to be able to go two or three towns away but mostly it's you know it's in town yeah that kind of stuff okay thank you yeah, for this. So, for those watching at home and that can't see this chart, um, anyway, for those in the audience, so in June of 2017, um, there was a presentation on seniors, and they had some really interesting statistics, and that was that in Reading, based on our census data, by 2030, we would have 8,000 residents that were over the age of 60. Um, one third of homeowners um, are senior. Uh, in, but in 2015, one-third of our homeowners were seniors. One-third lived alone. 88% um, of our seniors have incomes less than $50,000, and one-third have disabilities. Um, so when we talk about seniors, these statistics are really important as far as what it means for us. Um, one of the things that you said that struck me is that is the idea of a community center where it's joint with other demographics within the population mm -hmm. is not a popular It's path. not, I, and I'll give you specific. So, if you want, but and, and that I can I believe you <laughs> um, but my question is you know as I look at this chart that you've presented and and look at the broader demographics right. the over 60 as of 2030 mm -hmm. there we have this that, big, that's what it uh, it's that, not that, that's the max that's right, right? right so what happens 30 years after that when frankly okay my generation then okay. bumps into that 
60 and over. It, well, so okay, what will happen is this: the popul I've got the I've got this actually on a different chart, but basically the population is not going to decrease before 2050. So the increases are going. There's two things that are going to go on. The increase is going to I, I don't, happen through through 2030. It will not actually drop because people don't. Once they turn 60, they all die. Right. <laughs> so in point of fact, you know, before 2050, no, there won't be any. Hey, we're good. We're good here. Okay. I'm, I'm simply saying that 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 the support. What I'm concerned about to, as a person, and and this this is is who's going to do the supporting, you know, in in, in the community. Right. That's a real, to me, I can't think of a more major issue as I see the population. So one of the things that um, I, I have spoken with residents um, that fall into the senior category, and one of the issues that has been raised is the idea of young seniors versus older seniors, because the needs are different. And so we have young seniors who are more active. They want right. educational programs. They want fitness programs. Right. These are the things that help exactly. us keep them young. Yep. Um, and then we have the older seniors who have more medical needs, more mental health issues. And so as a town, we need to be able to tackle both of those. I, we did have a presentation, I don't remember when, um, from Dementia Friendly Reading Great. that yeah. is working with local businesses, especially <laughs> banks, to help um, that's train their employees. So I, I know that's something yeah. that's being Good. It has been done well. in a lot of towns. I'm glad to say that. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's true. Uh, but the, the issue is, well, the funny thing is, if you were to go into some of the senior centers and have a 90-year-old leading a fitness program, you realize... You know, it's just not what, what you think it is. Or I, I, I don't know if any of you have played chair volleyball. It's hysterical. All the, can, <laughs> this is something you can do with your grandchildren, right? Because there's there's a net in the middle, and and they all have to stay, and they're getting all this exercise, and they don't even know they're getting it because they're laughing so hard and all this stuff trying to get a ball over the net. It's a beach ball, right? I mean, so, yeah. Sorry, uh, I get carried away. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're, you're wonderful. You're. It's. It's. I'm sure everyone at home is thanking you for your liveliness. We're, tend to be a little dry so <laughs> um, all of this data has been wonderful and it's definitely eye-opening how do you help us that's a very rare question yeah. I have a question <laughs> from your travels um, is a location important in the senior center does it need to be a standalone does it need to be integrated in the community somehow does it matter um, I, we have, we have, I, want, I want to thank Jane for you know, seeing the downtown is like uh, <laughs> I mean, I will tell you this, you probably need, uh, for every 100 square feet, you need one car space. That's about what it comes down to. I mean, I can say that again? For every 100 square feet of actual footage in the senior center, you're going to need uh, a space for a car. That's what people will do. They, they will come. If you get, they will come. They will, they get, I, I mean, it's just, it's just what, what happens? Outside um, of the where, state. Have there been, you know, you hear these stories occasionally of these communities coming together um, to help address community space needs and senior needs, right? So, okay, no one in the state is doing it, but are there shining examples elsewhere that have done this successfully? When you're thinking elsewhere, you have to remember that Massachusetts and New England does not really have much of county government. So if you're seeing that kind of stuff happen, it's happening outside of New England. Because in New England, it ain't happening. If you build, if I mentioned, I mentioned, um, you know, uh, Weymouth. It's like they'll come if this. They'll go. They'll, they'll go to Freetown. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's if if they like it. Just show up. So to follow up on, on uh, Vanessa's question, because obviously, um, you know, seniors is, you know, we talk about over 55, how, well, 55 is, is like, the, you know, that it's it used to be 25. That's right. So, yeah. That's right. so That's right. but there are, you know, people who are 60 to 80 or you know, 60 to 75 are different from people who are over 75. So, you know, because the needs are going to be different. So in your travels, but, but my question is, is that in your travels, you've seen all these centers. Are they able to integrate? all of the, basically, um, all of the needs of the various populations, or is it more like, oh, this is more for, 
if you're not active, you don't. I mean, it's a great. So it helps us program in terms of right. what what kind of a facility we think we're going to need that's going to address. Well, right. So so I'm going to go back. The ones to who need I, the most help who may not be the most vocal. The the I go back to what I mentioned about maybe you know, ten minutes ago or so, and that is you go to four or five senior centers. I'd be happy to suggest some of similar size and say what makes it work. In fact, I brought the report from Marshfield, almost identical. to your side. Don't this. It's like, and you look at this, and they did this originally uh, in about 2006 or something like that, and and they said, oh, they'll love this. You'll appreciate this. They had a room it was about like this, and a little rubber floor, and they said, because this is only only this many people's ever going to come to yoga for Tai Chi, right? Within three weeks, they took over the entire eating area. True story. But they thought that this is all it's going to be because you know that's that's all it's you know, that's all the need is or whatever the story. So I'm saying being flexible. Yeah, I, I I love to say this. I meet up with the attitude. Blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be bent out of shape. Yeah. So so so. so, so. <laughs> It's my own. I could copyright yeah, that's, 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 that's <laughs> it. But that, but that, but the, the point is, when you visit half a dozen places, you know, and I would say, you know, and they're different architects and all that stuff. But you realize that every single one that I've been to is too small, mm -hmm. except for the Tom Irving. And I don't say that because I like to see people spend money. I like to see public money make it easy for people to live in community right. and improve the quality of life. Right. That's all I'm getting out of this, and I, I think that's a lot. Yeah, I mean, thank you. Thanks a lot for your presentation. I, you're really preaching to the choir here. Um, I think... Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Is there yes. capital money available through any programs you administer? Uh, <laughs> I, he he it's, cuts it's, right to the chase. Well, well, I, no, 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 for improvements, but not yes. senior mm. centers is, yeah. is right. something that schools uh, too they have, yeah. they have, schools a, too. They have a fund. It's like right. because the seniors, the seniors, well, what percent? Oh, this is really myself a little yeah, trouble. Yeah, this one. Trouble. What percent? <laughs> percent of um, we think with seniors, what percent of the ta of of the budget do seniors get back from the budget? Now, yeah. what I'm going to say is this. For property tax, whatever it is, I'm going to say 35, 38, 40, 42 percent, something like that. The taxes, property taxes are coming by seniors. The average senior center, actually, the average COA budget in Massachusetts for seniors is two tenths of one percent return. I can come up with the numbers. I can get them for you. Yep. But I'm telling you, that's the part that's sort of the highest one in the state is eight tenths of one percent. For most around two tenths of one percent or less. So it's sort of like a, a community. It's, you can't make it a community center. It will because it's their home away from home. And if you go in there and you say, I've learned, you know, whatever it is, you you've taken up Spanish or you have whatever. You know, it's like it's opportunities. It really is. But Emmett, you didn't answer my question. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is really answer the answer is unless somebody else comes up with money, you know. But that's that's so the there are no there are no state programs available to help with the capital side. Is that what you're telling me? Unless you know somebody who has a who does um, an earmark somehow in the budget and yeah. slips six yeah. million dollars in the governor's budget, then you have something. Other than that, okay, I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, John, I learned that the session that um, you can get things you're like you're marked like a, a van or something like that but there's from what I was told there's no yeah, capital okay what about uh, program money what kind of well, that's what the formula grant is there for okay right. but right. you know what happens if um, we build a senior center we find our own way to approve that capital you know internally inside well, this town or yeah, any other way so st right. stay with me so, for a second sure. okay we get that built it's adequate size to accommodate the senior population and now we got to develop what you have said is if you develop programs people will utilize the space we don't want to build something that doesn't get utilized so that begs the next question if there's no capital money available is there separate from the the pro rata shares that get moved by population if jane brings you a program that needs 
a hundred thousand dollars is there is there any way that we can think about that as being an opportunity within the state um, I can't speak for the state, but I would say the opportunities, it's just, it's a matter of somebody having an interest. For instance, you have people who go, they, for elders used to be, this was funny, a good instructor would go from town to town to town, which I already mentioned. It's not the programs, I mean, the programs are what? You've got fitness and people help pay for the, the fitness, I mean, they're giving two or three dollars or whatever for this thing, and you've got 60 people who are having a blast, you know, in the cafeteria. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's a matter of opportunities, and people, the seniors themselves will because it's 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 the pretty it's not expensive to get the programs. I mean, they're really not. Well, there is ex there's lots of different expenses involved in programs. I mean, saying, I've worked on those in a, in a variety of different age groups. Um, you know, program specialists, for example, cost money. It's not you know it's it, not it, the it, trinkets it, that go into the program. It's well, the people that administer it and bring it forward. But, so but, my question to you is a simple one. The State Department of Elder Affairs, does it have the opportunity for us to come after program? Um, just, just some ideas of what they, this counts as doing. Okay, so it's, it's easy enough to do this, this, this things that. No, I mean, the, the most community they recognize it's an expense. Like you're underwriting, you know, you underwrite schools and you underwrite the little league. Or I don't know what all, all the expenses are. They go, you know, you should, I should know because I'm a former town meeting member, but it's like, you know, you, you just do little things because it, it matters. It makes a difference. If it means, I, I, I mean, there are literally, I could give you 12 pages of programs um, that are going on, but each one's going to be unique. Uh, uh, simply, uh, humble examples, you know, come up all the time. One of the things that I'm concerned about, that it's, I'm, I'm off, off target to this, and maybe I've been one since I've already answered it, is I would love to have, that if the town on its annual census has two questions, and two questions of this. It was started in Western Mass. Maybe it don't come around here. I don't know. Two questions are, within the past 12 months, were you unable to get to a medical appointment due to a lack of transportation? Okay, this goes out with the annual census. And the second question is, if you were without power for X hours, would you want someone to contact you? So now you get a community-wide understanding of who's at risk, regardless of age, because it's on the annual census. Right? This is what now I've got, I, I hope by now, 15 or 20 communities doing this thing because frankly, it should be everywhere. Simple questions. No, in the past 12 months, we've been able to get to a medical appointment through the lack of transportation. And secondly, if you're without power for X hours, and they get to fill in the X. So that way you know, regardless of age, whether they're 40 years old or 20 years old or 100 years old, and I've met with a 105 year old one woman about six months ago on the Cape. Pretty amazing. Um, but it's like you're, you know, it's like you're beginning to see the community acting. What's called the city of Taunton does this community crisis intervention team. It doesn't have to be a city, but every person who comes in, they don't discuss names, but the police, the fire, the the uh, um, and, you know the tax collector. They all get to. They don't know the person's name, but they say, "How can we solve this problem?" That stuff is so good. It's easy to do. You don't need names. Um, can you, do you have a list? Uh, it sounds like you do this presentation a lot. Um, do you have this is actually the second time only I've ever done it before a board of uh, <laughs> Do you have a list of best practices, suggestions? You know, the idea the of the pages. one. Yeah, I got Wonderful. That. Can you email that to us? Uh, because I, I want to be sensitive to I, here. I love this, but I... Yeah, there's, uh, this is Watertown here. Hold on. And look at some of the, actually, you're going to get about 30 or 40 ideas yeah, that's from okay. this, this thing okay. alone. Wonderful. Believe me. Um, I'm going uh, we, we, we to, we need to hear from the town of Cowboy. Speaking of money. But, um, <laughs> so I, I, I'd like to thank you uh, very much for coming in. And um, a lot of food well, thank for you thought for inviting there. me. So a lot of food for thanks for coming. Yeah. 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 And, uh, I, I enjoy trying to see uh, see if things work. For we're people. we're trying to get it done. It's it's, it's yeah. a hard, but uh, I think yeah, we learned a lot. We a lot of little things. things. We do so a lot of little things. A lot of notions. Right. That well, I would I would. The only thing I'd ask of you is, yes. if you want to, is have people who come to the senior go to senior centers. It's just a visit two or three, and, and just see what go what ticks, and then you'll see what their love is and, and what what works. It's yeah. Cool. I mean, I think uh, well, we have two members who are working on capital projects and this will fall under that but some 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 sort of um, 
town-wide survey for this type of thing. Um, I, 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 we've done that before. You have done the override, it. Yeah. and um, it was it was very informative, and um, so that we can find the needs that fit red and residents. <coughs> well, I I would I. I understand what you're saying, mm -hmm. and my, my suggestion is, if people go and get the sense when they go to this to these other communities and say, this is what we want, yeah. you will get that as much as you will from the survey, because they're not old yet. Sure, of course. So it's it's like it's like one of those things. But if somebody comes in here and says, you know, we bring somebody in to the seniors, or put them on cable TV, by the way, I'm really a pusher of, of cable, and they come in, you realize that there are people who watch cable 2 a.m. and 2 p.m. because they want to know what's going on. And they watch it seven days a week. Am I making this up? No. It's just that you're seeing opportunities, and that's that's really the goal. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. All right. Do we need a break, folks? Yeah, we're or taking two minutes. Two minutes. Two, two minute, two minute break? All right. Great.
Thank you. Um, back in session, over to the town account. Thank you, Andy. So I'm going to give you a quick quarterly update as where we stand. Um, as far as reporting for um, fiscal 18, we're all done with all of that. We've gotten our free cash certification. We've set our tax rate. We've done our Schedule A um, filing to DWAR. And the end of year got done probably in the beginning of the season. And that's done by Gail primarily, but I have a component that I do for her. Our fiscal 18 audit is also complete. We're waiting on draft financials. Um, we are waiting on a report from Siegel. It seems like everybody's trying to get this GASB 74 report that's needed to finalize the financials. But once, once we get it, um, we begin working on continuing disclosure for our bondholders um, so that they know we're in good financial condition, that we're doing well. Um, so a lot of that comes from the audited financial statements. But we've already gotten the request from our um, bond agent, and so we are starting to work on what we can. And as we get the financial statements, that will get completed. The thing that you see on the screen is an informational guidelines release that um, was supposed to go in effect a few years ago and then got postponed because some legislation was out there that could have potentially changed it. And it's related to um, PEG access, which is public education and governmental access for cable television. Um, from what I understand, every cable TV purchaser um, pays some sort of fee on their cable bill that funds um, PEG access. And they, they forward that money to us, Verizon and Comcast, and we have a contract with RCTV to provide those services. Um, and so we forward that money to RCTV. Um, the way that um, DLS is looking at this is they really feel like they want consistency in the way it's done across all cities and towns, and they also believe that it should be an article at town meeting, appropriated at town meeting, so that it's acknowledged that the funds coming in are town funds, and then they're outsourcing someone to do the service. Um, and so that's the position that they're taking, and they're basically saying to us, you have a couple options, and I put this in your packet if you wanted to read through it. They said we would like to see either a, re a receipts reserve um, revolving fund for it, or an enterprise fund. The thing that's kind of confusing is how do you transition to a receipts reserve because in order to appropriate out of a receipts reserve, the money's already got to be there, so it makes it very difficult. This is supposed to be in effect July 1st, 2019, so we will need to act on it at April town meeting. Um, and we get these payments kind of quarterly, so we're getting them throughout the year, so this, all the money wouldn't be there right now to give them. So I feel like the enterprise fund makes the most sense, and it would be um, voted every year, a budget with estimated revenues. We'd estimate what our revenues would be, and our expenses would um, obviously be a balanced budget, just like your water, sewer, and stormwater. So I just wanted to give you a briefing on that, because it is going to be an article that was added um, to our April town meeting warrant. Um, and, it, and it does have to do with um, this IGR, and we don't want to be in non-compliance, so we are going. We're going to request um, an enterprise fund for the PEG access. So that is that. As far as financial staffing in the finance department, we are finally fully staffed and starting to transition roles, and things are going very nicely and smoothly. And we are already starting to feel the effect of being fully staffed. So I am so grateful um, for that override. Um, add that assistant town accountant because I'm starting to be able to delegate small things but still it, it provides just you know as we free up her time as she transitions her role to the next person more time is being allotted to me to train and and you feel it every little bit so I am so grateful for that um, as far as um, the financial update I put um, some things in your packet um, that I look at kind of high level just to give you an idea of what we're looking at um, start with the um, revenues Sharon do you know what page within the packet that this starts on yes it is on 5c 17 is the revenue summary oh. <coughs> say that again 5c 17 is what I picked up on is that big enough to be seen? No, that wasn't in our packet, though. Oh, man, maybe. It was at the back. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, you're right. Uh -huh. so, it's in there. Yeah. Let's see if I can make this viewable. That's good. A little bit more to the right. Yeah, because I think... Well, maybe a little bit smaller. That gives us a... Is that viewable? <laughs> it is kind of small stuff. Let's see. Yeah. Not really. 
Not really? 90. Well, I mean, I have it on my works. screen, but I don't know if What'd you say? 90. You think 90? People at home can see it. I think it's about... Isn't it on page like 100? 135. But your packet was rather big. 135, yeah. Yeah. If you get rid of that bar on the right, it'll make yeah, it a little bit more. Little arrow it'll get a little more space. Oh, this one here? Nope, nope. Right in the middle. That one, yep. This one here? Nope. This one? Up. <laughs> oh, this one? Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So this is kind of a high level like of our revenue um, for the general yeah. fund. I'm kind of just done by category. Um, and so, and this this has been run through December 31st, and it compares what our revenues look like to budget, but also to what it looked like last year at the same time. At six months through the year, you'd expect revenues to be somewhere in that 50% range, and we are right about there. Last year, we were just over um, this 50.99%. We're at 49.35. Down here are other financing sources, and that, that's going to just be me moving money. So if I haven't done it yet, it's going to show a difference. Um, but in general, the, the revenues are up here, the section that says 01, and it's categorized delinquent property taxes, real estate taxes, motor vehicle. One thing to note is motor vehicle excise, the big commitment, the first commitment of the year, um, is done in January. So that hasn't even gone out yet. And we're still at our 50%. So there's really not that much cause for concern, although this is looked at every month, um, to see if there's any um, chance that we might have some revenue deficits. But there are things that are timing in motor vehicle excise as well one of them where you know what we're collecting is really you know motor vehicle from the prior year <laughs> so we have zero delinquent property taxes is that am i reading this wrong um it looks oh, like we collected, collected that we don't we don't have a budget for delinquent property taxes uh, okay. but we've collected forty-four thousand so far oh, okay but this is not what's outstanding no okay. no what's happening with earnings on investments earnings on investments is huge and i think we talked about that um our, we're getting like double the um, return that we had been getting, and so we had increased at November town meeting, trying to get there. But we didn't have we had extra money there that we didn't have a source to use it for, and so because we've had this influx of double the interest rate that we're getting, on we're definitely outpacing what we have on the budget. So it could also be a funding source for something else going forward if we you know we could increase the projected revenues for. Um, for interest earnings or earnings on investments and use it towards something else that's needed, say, in April if we needed to. But it is the area that we were talking about that we see going forward that we're going to Well, banks went from paying zero to paying two one basis points. So yeah. We, we that really, adds yeah, it really does. So that's where we stand, and just at a high level, just to show you that we're not in um, danger of any kind of revenue deficit at this point. Then I'm going to bring up the... Um, the expenses for the general fund, and I ran that by category um, that they are voted at town meeting. Can everybody read that? At 100%. Yeah. <laughs> So the categories that you see um, at town meeting that we vote, most departments are salary and expense, and so we can't commingle it. We can't go over that line item. So for administrative services, they're at 46.2% of their salaries and 64.5% of their expenses, and capital is at 76.1%. None, none are in de deficit for that department, and overall 58% of the budget is um, expended. But as I said, you can't commingle these. The one that stands out as um, you know it problematic easily is usually salaries because they tend to be expended pretty much equally throughout the year. So if you're seeing a number that's over 50 percent, it might highlight to you um, we definitely have a problem. But so knowing where we are within the year can kind of um, highlight a problem with salaries pretty easily. But expenses aren't always expended equally throughout the year, so there's a lot more research involved. But making sure, I do this exercise just to make sure that nobody is in a deficit, that we haven't got a problem immediately on the forefront. And so looking at public services, you can see that they're okay, finance is okay. You know, there's not anything that's highlighting like, oh my gosh, what's happening there? And sometimes it could be something just in the wrong place if there is a, you know, a high percentage. Um, but, you know, capital is one of those things where once they've awarded a contract, they're going to put a PO out there and it's going to be 100% used or the majority of used. Capital, I would say, once they've got things going and they've selected a contractor, 
a lot of times that's expended 100% right away. That doesn't indicate a problem. As long as so, it's not over. <laughs> so if salaries are significantly lower than the 50%, is that an indication that maybe we haven't filled positions? Or? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times that's the question I'll be asking, you know, what's going on. Um, and then if there is something that looks like it's trending high when I'm looking at this, I would be reaching out to a department head saying, something doesn't look right and maybe I might be drilling in myself um, to help them find it, whatever that issue is some some um, areas like snow and ice and facilities are voted bottom line um, but most departments it's salary and expense so I ran it this way just to give you kind of that viewpoint and to show that you know we're kind of in good shape so far <laughs> so looking at the enterprise funds Start with water. Sharon? Yep. Sorry, can, do you mind if I take a step back? Um, on DPW trash, no street lighting. Um, expenses are at 72%. Um, I know we tend to undercut that one because we can never quite budget <coughs> for what our snow expenses are going to be. Is that on track with previous years? Well, the snow, the oh. snow, which land are we talking? DPW trash and snow. Oh, five, I think. Yeah, I'm on. Um, 5C2, and it's, yeah, I think Bob, did you, sorry. Oh, 70%, the 70.5%? Yeah, the um, rubbish contracts are fully encumbered for the whole year. They do two six-month mm -hmm. clumps, so yeah, that that's 100% spent. If you see the, the encumbered you. column, um, that's PO. So when they have a contract in place, they will um, issue a PO for the full amount of the contract. There it is. So if it's in that encumbered column, it means that there's a PO holding the budget so that it can't be expended. Once the bills come in, they, it reduces the encumbrance and then increases the actual expense. Thank you. Good questions. Sharon? Yeah, uh, oh, oh, yeah. Are you done? I mean, so I had some just general questions. I, I, I'll, oh, I can yeah. Wait. I can go if you have for general fun. I was just going to show no, you. No, just general questions, not about okay. uh, But I, I can wait if you want to just You can tell me oh, if you want. <laughs> um, well, it's just a It's actually yeah. a question. Um, so um, at, at the MMA conference, one of the one of the sessions I sat into was best practices on, um, you know, financial plan, you know, fi you know finance. And um, they had some folks in from the state, um, and they're really... Um, they're, they're really interested in sort of helping communities get sort of really good at these financial tools. I, I think it's really more designed for some of the smaller towns that don't have mm -hmm. obviously our sophistication, but they do um, as part of the compact, kind of the community compact, um, they have put extra money into grants for things like look, you know, beefing up your kind of reporting and things like mm -hmm. that. So um, have you looked into that as, you know, basically, you know, things that you might need just like, oh, I wish I had this, that we well, could we report better and recently, um, send in a grant because they have money. That's the, Yeah, we actually asked yeah. for the Community Compact Grant to fund our cash management software for Munis as well as HR software, and we were awarded, I think it's like $45,000. <coughs> it's okay. already came yeah. in, actually. Mm -hmm. No sooner did they award it, it came right. in. Right, that's last quote. Right, right. but now they... Yeah. they they're talking about they actually increase that bucket. Oh, for the next for year. For this going forward for this fiscal year. So, So, I mean, I think there's always been that mentality that, oh, we won't get it. We're too affluent, but we got this money. Right. So that kind of like puts that thinking out there. Maybe we could get some more. Right. Maybe so, we can look at something else. Yeah, there's things that you need. I mean, they, you know, they're, they want towns to submit those applications. So. Good to know. Good to know. <laughs> Good suggestion. <laughs> So I'm going to pull up water revenues just to show you where we are there. And this is a more detailed look, but then in, in total, this is the same sort of um, look as the general fund where we're running it through December 31st. It shows you to budget. It's hard to see. It shows you to budget and then also last year's percent collected and where we were last year. So over here is um, last year and this year. And so we're right around where we were last year, around that 56%, and we're only halfway through the year um, when, when I'm running this report. So um, not a real concern for the revenues in water. There is, um, when I look at stormwater, a question, so I'll get there. <laughs> So in gross dollars, this is about three and a half million that that we've collected so far. Mm -hmm. 
sewer revenues um, last year were about 58.52 percent we're at 56.5 um, so yeah and we've collected 3.5 million dollars already out of a 6.2 million dollar budget so revenues are not a concern for um, sewer either at this point that doesn't mean it could you know we could stop collecting money um, <laughs> I wouldn't think so, but it's possible, I suppose. <laughs> this looked a little strange to me, and, and then I realized what it was. So stormwater, um, <coughs> if you look over here, the last year's revised budget was 360960 for revenues. That's what we projected. And then we last year at this time in December we had 223,000 of that 360 um, collected now the current year budget is at 517 or just under 518 because we increased the um, we increased the fee for stormwater from 40 to 60 and so then I was like well why didn't the you know why are we we're seeing similar um, amount of money 231 um, collected compared to 223 last year and when I um, inquired about this, I was told, well, the new rate doesn't go out until the December bills, and this is being run through December. So we'll see that, that effect hitting on the other end. Um, so, that, you know, so that's where something like this, my first look and glance at this, I and mean, obviously we dig deeper, but this is easiest to show you, um, just where it points me in the direction of where there might be an issue. Um, and this was definitely a question that had to be asked. And then the last thing I'm going to show you is just a summary of the enterprise funds by category. Um, enterprise funds are voted bottom lines, so but it, I still show them to you by category, um, as long as they don't go over in total um, without the cap. Yeah, in total they don't go over. Um, they're fine. So one could be negative, but in general they don't tend to go over. Um, th again, I was looking and said, okay, well, water is about 49% expended. Salaries are about 50%. Um, sewer is in that 41% range for salaries. You know, nothing's looking and highlighting as high. And then I look at stormwater and it looks kind of low. And drilling into that salary number at 26.4% in the prior year, they had two um, laborers working in stormwater, and in this year, there's only one. And and then I asked the question, well, why aren't they? If they're if they're it's injured, best, it's best you stop right there. Okay, <laughs> so they they only have one person. So <laughs> so that person's not working. So that affects the expenses a little bit because they're doing less work. They only got one person, but on top of that. Um, they, a lot of the work that's done in stormwater is done in the spring and in the fall. And so their expenses tend to trail a little bit anyway, but the loss of a person brings that back just a little bit. So so in general, like my you know preliminary look at this, I was not overly concerned in most areas. Stormwater was the only one where I was like, geez, that looks funny. Um, and then when we're doing our you know balancing and we start to look at each department's year-to-day -day budget report, we, we get more questions because it's more, I'm seeing all the accounts and so they, there might be issues within the accounts. But this is kind of the easiest way to show you without drilling into too much detail where we stand. Yeah. I think it's fantastic. Um, I just have a question. Just, question. Just, one, just one other quick comment. And actually, this is, I don't think so much for Sharon as it is really for the rest of us. So um, at, at this um, workshop, um, they were very encouraging of us to set our, have our classification hearings done a little bit early. We tend to do them sort of late October, almost into November. They were suggesting a best practice is to really kind of do them, you know, yeah, they said September, but like early to mid-October, uh -huh. because what happens is that everything comes in and then you run the risk of, um, they, they don't have as much, I mean, they were up front, they don't have as much staff to kind of do that. So the quicker you get in, the quicker you set your thing because everything comes at the end you don't want to be part of the funnel that's at the end so mm -hmm. it may mean for scheduling purposes that we look at doing this maybe you know moving it up one meeting um, they were pretty you know that was one of the, the, the takeaways they wanted people to go home with so they want to get the stuff over there so this year we needed to uh, be a little careful because of the senior tax relief being new. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so that went right through the first day right. in September. But I know it didn't impact now us. Now on, but yeah, you know, Victor can speed that could. up by certainly two uh, weeks. So that was just, that was just the only thing that came out of that that okay. I thought would be helpful really for all of us.
That was um, all I had to present. Unless you have other questions. I, I, I'd like to um, thank you for a very clear explanation of how our money is spent, how it comes in, and I encourage the public. Um, it may look intimidating at first when you see it, but if you look through the page, page, pages, page by page, it does make sense and it will tell you where our money comes from and goes to. So and it's being spent the way we said it was going to be spent, mm -hmm. so, as important. Thanks, Sharon. Well, one thing I should mention before I go is um, there will be something I'll have to bring to you with the next meeting. It's uh, um, internal controls for federal grants um, that Gail and I are working on. It just needs select board approval. Um, so it's a long document, and we haven't got it in final form yet. So as soon as I have it, I will bring it to you. Um, it definitely just needs to be kind of blessed by the select board, according to the auditors, just to be sure that you're aware of what we've kind of put into the document. And Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Sharon. <laughs> okay. Um, now over to Bob for a preview of the warrant article for town meeting. Uh, let me see. I'm going to go a little bit fast because we have some audience uh, members for one of the articles. Um, I'll try to mention uh, whether an article is routinely in an annual town meeting or something that's new. Mm -hmm. uh, the election's on April 2nd. Reports are always delayed till the end. And instructional motions um, are, I'm sorry, reports are done. Instructional motions delayed to the end in capital. Those <coughs> items two, three, and four are designed by charter to be those first three articles after an election in an annual town meeting. Uh, typically, in this year, be the same. We'll amend the FY19 budget. I guess we won't have as much of a snow star plus as I had hoped. Uh, we'll have prior year's bills. Right now, Sharon doesn't have any, but if she gets gets any, we will be declaring some surplus materials. You can see my notes over here. Um, we have a suggested general bylaw for a surplus policy that the bylaw committee has not had time to discuss. Um, so I'm not sure if we'd go forward with that, but it's been over a year that we've wanted to, so we may have um, Allison Jenkins, our procurement officer, and to see you at the next meeting to go over it because it can certainly be sponsored by the select board. Um, and another annual meeting typical, typical event is to appropriate funds into OPEB. Um, we have town meeting voter budget that specifies a certain amount. Uh, as long as health insurance hasn't run into a difficulty during the year, we then move that amount previously voted into the trust fund uh, at April. Sharon mentioned the new revolving fund or cable access. I think that's going to be a little tricky to administer, so we'll have to talk about that. Um, where town meeting is going to be asked to approve it, we're not sure for the first year how much detail they'll want to see, for instance, from RCTV's budget, mm -hmm. since it's an enterprise fund like any other budget. I'm going to stop there because we are also the town involved in negotiations with RCTV right now, so we'll try to wrap those up before this uh, has to happen. Then there's the annual approval of revolving funds and also the annual approval for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. I know one of your goals is to discuss whether to change that. The ideal time to change it would be at a November town meeting, so next November, for instance. If uh, November town meeting does change uh, the way we approach it, then we could skip this next year, but we have to do this uh, for this year. Okay. The bylaw committee, uh, again, Town Council perhaps could give us an update, but they haven't met in a while. They did just get a new member. Yeah. Um, we believe they're ready with gender neutral language. I know Council has provided them a version. Um, the next two items I'll skip over quickly and we'll come back to one. There's a purchase of some land at Timber Next Swamp. I spoke to the owner uh, last late last week. He's interested in going forward um, to be discussed. Have we arrived at a price with, at a price with him? Uh, he preferred to sell it than donate it, as, as far as we got. So, well, we can get there. Yeah, I mean, it shouldn't be hard. We've had been having that discussion with him off and on for okay. several years. Yeah, I uh, I can talk to you offline, but the email address he gave me doesn't seem to be working. So I tested it out and it got kicked back to me last night. 
Um, we'll discuss 15 in, in much more detail shortly. It's uh, approving an easement in Simon's Way. Um, I didn't include this in your packet because, for one thing, you have a uh, subcommittee meeting on it next Monday. I didn't want to front run them. And also, we're having a staff meeting tomorrow. But there's likely to be as many as six debt, debt authorizations requested for all capital projects. And again, we'll, Vanessa and I will talk about that more in detail next Monday. Okay. But just to list them quickly, uh, building security improvements, Turf 2, uh, the Auburn water tank, um, those are all things you should be familiar with. Mm -hmm. Grove Street water main is something new. Uh, Sturgis sewer station has been on a long-term plan. And then uh, the drainage work on Main Street has been on a long-term plan. So only, only the Grove Street one is new. <clears throat> I, I expect all or most of those to go forward, but we'll know uh, next time. <laughs> and then there's the annual budget, uh, a very small housekeeping uh, chapter 90 uh, authorization. And last but not least, to remove town meeting members if folks have not attended. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a good solid two nights. If we have all that debt authorization, those are typically reasonably quick, but it still requires a certain amount of time for presentation. Mm -hmm. It's possible we go to three nights um, with this. It's, it's a heavily f finance oriented agenda, not a lot of policy, um, which has not been typical in the last few years. Um, so that's an overview of if there's any questions before we circle back and get into more detail on any of them. Bob, the only recommendation I have is um, under Article 2 for reports, Dan yeah. will no longer be on the board. Okay. Um, so I'm happy to do that unless someone else is really dying to do the RML. Yeah, I can well, I, I think you're a better position than the rest of us. I mean, we may retain him as far as the say. subcommittee goes, um, or the joint subcommittee. Okay, yeah, so the board can decide. But we can decide that. Okay. Good cat. Who's but that's it. Okay, anything else? Okay, um, let's uh, have a little bit more of a discussion on Simon's Way uh, Range Road. Um, I'll invite Attorney Latham to speak, and I'll just give a really quick overview. Um, going back you know, two, three years anyways, uh, the topic came up. Uh, Zani's owned some land over by Simon's Way that they're not using productively. There's uh, two parcels. I'll just call them kind of the north parcel and the south parcel for simplicity, and I'm sure council will get into more detail. The north parcel is, um, is wet. Um, not a lot of highest and best uses, uh, but certainly is potentially um, a very interesting parcel for the town to acquire for uh, passive recreation for trails. Uh, conservation and the Trails Committee, I think, would be pretty interested. And these are discussions we have not had with those committees yet. This is the first time we're discussing it publicly. Um, <clears throat> the southern parcel, if you will, is, is a little more complex. Uh, it is dry land. Um, under the right circumstances, I would say it's developable. Uh, those circumstances include the need for an easement. So <clears throat> what we had done uh, last summer, I believe, was get an independent appraiser. Um, that packet was in your report, uh, as was mentioned dur earlier during public comment. There's uh, two loose appraisals on the value of the land with and without an easement that are substantially different in value. I know uh, Brad will get into some of the background. It's an interesting historical parcel. And uh, the reason Brad wanted to come in and discuss this is because it is a bit of a juxtaposition between if the town an easement, then without. And if the town is the buyer, technically the abutter. So we don't have to give ourselves an easement. You, you're very open and above board about the situation. And I think it's uh, you know, very commendable to do it that way. Did you call up? So, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Just a plain scan. There's no number after it. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I'm here with uh, Bill and Ray Gagan, uh, who are involved with the Zani family. I'd like to give you a quick overview of the Zani's, who they are, and then a history, because this is a very unusual site, a very unusual history with this site. Mm. Um, the Zani's immigrated from Italy about 1890. They built the Reading all that time. Uh, there are currently about 20 family members living in town. They do not have a high profile. Um, and uh, they had a construction business for years, which closed down recently. Um, they have done a lot of generous things for the town. 
they actually built Little League Park when it was first built, like Memorial Park. Uh, they have done things at discounts, cost only for Burbank by some of the site work there. When it came time for the town to close the landfill, it needed the RMLD needed an easement to come off of their, through their property. They gave that gratis to the town. They've been good citizens, and we asked if the selectmen would keep that in mind. We hope town meeting would as well. Getting to the site itself, if I could, orient you, if I may. Simon's Way comes off here and comes up in this direction. That is all a public way at this point. Uh, that was developed as a consequence, really, of the Burbank Ice Arena. Uh, that's where it started. Uh, the other branch of that, which is called on this this town map Simon's Way, but it's not really, it's called Range Road, I think, vernacularly. Yeah. Um, the area here that I'm going, that's in blue, is the actual perimeter of the zoning property. Uh, the Range Road is on the, on the Zani's property. Uh, it's not on town land. I'll recite how that came to pass. You, the gap in question is right there. Their property line ends here. The public portion of the Simon's Way goes that way. What basically happened is the Zani's originally owned property sort of like this. In the Cold War period in 1954, the federal government felt the need to establish a Nike defense system on the East Coast. Uh, they took Bear Hill on the southern part of Reading, which we're now fighting over the housing for that, as the radar location and their facilities. They had to have a line of sight directly down to where the silos were going to be, the missiles were going to be down where in this area right back here. They never got built, but as part of all of this, they took certain called masking easements, so no one would build a certain height uh, and block their ability to communicate with their uh, missile defense if they had to be launched. So they took all property in different forms. They took some forms in easements, some forms in the fee. They took an easement over the property belonging to the Zanis. They took an easement through here, through the Zanis property. They then took the fee and all of this. So they took a portion of the Zani's property here in fee, absolute ownership. In about 19, I forget the dates right here, I think it was in the late 60s, they decided this was surplus land, they didn't need it. So they gave land back in different ways to the people from whom they took it. Well, they gave the Zani's back their property free of any easement, except this easement here, they gave that to the town of Reading. So the, the Zanis own that land, but it's subject to the town's right of way over, which the town then granted, gave to the Reading Rifle Club in the 60s, 1968, the right to use that. Not unlike what we're asking the town to do now, is to give a simple easement over an existing way for that little connector right there to connect the Simon's way. The town was given the fee and the rest of this. So by that, coincidence of that lot line, we end up with a gap, and that gives rise to a need for relief. Uh, you've heard certain, you heard a number early time about 1.3 million. Who knows if that's a true number? Who knows if anyone will really buy it for that? I mean, who, who knows if the town will buy it or anybody else will buy it? But the idea is that this was originally a construction stockyard. That's where they store their materials and so forth. They of course, don't need that anymore that, now that they've retired. So, they are getting elderly from Mayville, and they are looking to try and take some of their assets and, and provide for their own well-being for the rest of their lives. And the hope, therefore, is that they can create the connector and then have an ability to use their land. Now, I will say that that, easement, that action right there has never been interrupted. When the government gave this back to them and gave it to the town, they have continually used that. Uh, for access. So what we're trying to do is perfect the title by means of an access easement grant right in that area there. So I'm going to ask if, uh, Bob, if you could put up uh, scan 8. Could I, could I just, before you go on, ask a, a quick question uh, for those of us who aren't realtors and, and familiar with uh, taking in fee. Um, Explain it, please. please. A fee is the actual ownership of land. It's yeah. considered to be a bundle of rights, but it's the absolute ownership of the land in mm -hmm. perpetuity. 
An easement is simply a non-possessory right to cross land, whether it's with electricity or with its uh, traffic or whatever it may be. So that's the distinction I'm trying to make here. So when the, when the government took that one area, uh, they gave the fee to the town, and that extinguished in question the rights, the easement rights that these folks had had all those years. Paul? And the little section that you're talking about. Um, Bob, can you blow that up a little bit, please? Ah, there we go. That's much better. Um, so, so the easement you're looking for is that uh, right angle stretch. Um, no, I'm sorry. Right there. Right there, yeah. Okay. So Just above it, the right. It's an existing stretch. road. There's no change yeah. required by the town. Yeah, uh, and drive over that road right, right now. Right, and there was never that was never drive to the rifle range. By the rifle as you approach the uh, right. as you approach the, the the hockey rink. Yeah, so I, looking at the hockey rink, you go left. Right to the baseball field and the hockey rink, or you go to the right behind the hockey the rink, rifle range and to the rifle range. And so, oh, go ahead. Um, I am not an engineer, so as I look at or city planner, so as I look at this map, I, I, I need a little bit of clarification, which is that that road that exists, correct? Yes, that one there. What would an easement allow you to do that you cannot, that the owners cannot do now? It would give them a title right to cross it. They've crossed it for years. The only time they didn't when the U.S. government had possession, mm -hmm. but they would not have the actual recorded deed right to use that. Even though they use it in a yeah. uninterrupted because it's a landlocked now, so this, yeah. they can't. They don't have so, so, and that, that land was never that easement that you're looking for. That land has always been owned by the town. No, that land is owned government? by families from whom it was taken by the U.S. government. What, what the U.S. government did, they took from many right. different private owners, uh -huh. and they then ended up giving it back to the, the town, paid 30000 for it. They actually gave it back to the town. No, I shouldn't say back. They gave it to the town, mm -hmm. the town use, even though they took it from private parties. And that section there of road, um, that belonged to whom before the U.S. government? I, it, I think it may have been Wakefield family. I'm not sure. Nesmith or mm -hmm. Simons, they're all on land down there. I can research that. But I don't recall offhand who had the actual fee of that. But that was, what was interesting was that for eons, for at least from the 1940s when the Zanis bought the property, they used that uninterruptedly, yeah. as did apparently the Rifle Club used it. Yes. Yeah. Rifle Club came to the town in the 60s and asked, please give us the easement. They did. They they needed it not just over here, they needed it all the way across the Zani property. They, yeah. they were totally landlocked. Town gave so, it to them. Another point of clarification, that little piece where they want the easement, is that not a public road if it is owned by the town? It's not the public road. The Simons Road taking comes up like this. They never carried anything down there. So It's owned by the town, it's used as a road, but it's not categorized as a public road. way. Yeah. So is it a private way? It's owned by the town, uh, so it's a private use. To <laughs> well, we road that we don't we maintain it. It's a paved path. path. Yeah. I don't know. Who, who plows it? Do you know? Pardon me? Who plows it? Um, well, I do know that the, um, certainly the, the rifle club, or the rifle range would want throughout the course of the year to have it be open. I don't know the answer to yeah, that. I don't either. I don't plow it, but we I, plow Simon's way for sure. But. My guess is, uh, you know, well, we just plow trucks down there. Yeah, I up on that, you assume it looks like a road. It yeah, just it it's like a road. Yeah. Okay. Does it? And now, is it safe to say that? Um, so the rifle range was granted at no for no fee the opportunity to be able to use Range Road to access private property. That's my understanding. I have a copy of that easement grant of this whole stretch. Including the small piece road. that you're talking about? Pardon? Including that, that small? Yeah, they, they actually had nothing, and they had to get all of this right from the town, and then the right through here. Now, the Zanis don't need anything from the town, because they actually own this area, right. subject to the easement. So all they need is, just, is like 100 feet long. So the town has had a history of contributing to private owners, access to their property. In this case, it was the rain. They, they, they granted the rifle range the opportunity to, to transverse that um, to get to their property. 
Is the range a nonprofit organization? The range is a it is a selected nonprofit. It's a private club. It's not a five hundred one c three. Yeah, I think the, the the philosophy at that time was it was the right thing to do. I, I think that's absolutely what happened there, and I think that's I think that's why you're in front of us today. So, I mean, this well, seemed to have been overlooked in the exactly in the right. shuffle. If the you know, fifty had, years ago, if the Zionists had piggybacked at that time, I have no doubt in my mind that that was given to them to the British. Yeah. In trying to just restore that which was taken away by the U.S. government. If if there is there a reason why this is being requested? So it sounds like they've owned this property for decades. They owned this. The Zionists owned this since 1940. Okay. Um, is there a reason why this easement is being requested now, approaching the sale of the property as opposed to while they? in any previous time. Because they kept using it and no one said they couldn't use it and there's a road there and now they've reached a stage where if they are going to sell it but do something with it, they have to have a easement. I, I just want to make sure I heard you correctly <coughs> that they're asking the town to give back what was taken away years ago, but that's not exactly true if they never own that section of land. Well, I, I, if, I, if I made you believe that I said they're giving back what was taken away, that's all, well, well in one sense that is correct, although I don't think I said it. They had, a, they had a right over here. There are different kinds of easements. There are easements by necessity, meaning mm -hmm. that you need it to get to the land, easement mm -hmm. by use, mm -hmm. prescriptive easements. They had a legal right to use this, even though they don't have a record recorded right to right. use that. Because yeah. they use it from the 1940s right. for some period of time. But if they, want to, if they want to sell it, though, they need that easement because um, the new owner would not have that same Exactly right. 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 That's yeah. exactly right. So, so oh, Bob has a question. Bob, yeah. Um, why would the town grant an easement over a road that the town doesn't own? The town was given, uh, in fact, let me go look and I can call up, you want to see something convoluted if I may, <laughs> bear with me. Um, if you go to uh, 14, scan 14, this is a plan of the Army Corps of Engineer plan. This is the Army Corps of Engineer plan. If you go down, Bob, okay, thank you. Second now. This is, I'm sorry the, the, the letters are sideways, but uh, the, the U.S. government put north to the west, uh, north to the side, yes. north, north to the top of the plan. I've marked this in yellow. That is Range Road. This shows what they took. And any time they took where it says an E, that means it was an easement they took. If there's an absence of an E like this, they took the fee ownership. So you can see here the U.S. government took an easement over this portion of the Zionese property. They didn't give that back to the Zionese. They gave the fee that everything else they took, but they gave that to the town. So that's why the town was able to give to the Rifle Club an easement over the Zionese property and this piece even though the Zani is pulling the underlying land. I see. Ms. Chet, there was a previous public comment um, regarding this. May I suggest that we open <coughs> public comment in the event that someone else would like to contribute, given the new, given the information, the presentation? Yes, however, there are, if, unless I misread the stuff that was in the packet, there are, there are three parcels that we're discussing here, not just this southern two. one? No, I'm only, I was only that's discussing the, that, the only that all, all we have asked for is going forward is on that piece. Oh, right Bob, there. you were, okay. Yeah, there was two other, parcels, right. this is the only thing, actually. Oh, but two parcels of the zone, or is it? One's to the north, not been shown tonight. Okay. And not the subject of discussion. Tonight. Right center field. Yeah. <laughs> okay, got it. But farther. Um, Deep in the woods. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, is that? Yes, are that's, you, you that's our case. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'll, I, I, I'd like to hear from the board and, and then um, quick public comment. So I, I, just, I just have a question. So um, obviously with our lack of field space and other kinds of things, um, this potentially could be a negotiation between the town and, and the Zanis if they wanted to entertain. And if we 
thought it was a, a good public purpose for the town to purchase the land, in which case, we, like Bob said earlier, we wouldn't necessarily need to give an easement. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I, I know field space and, and other kinds of things are a big um, priority. Right. Are we putting the cart before the horse in, in sort of granting an easement um, that on a potentially pe a potential piece of land that me we may want to approach the Zanis about um, for a public purpose and you know that's so are, are we negotiating against ourselves, ourselves right in, in which case then you know we ought to figure out a process in which is that something that they even want to entertain before we give an easement on something that we may want to come back and then have to pay a million dollars more for. So, so I, I want to... Uh, John. That, oh, that's all right. Go ahead. Finish your thought. And then I, but I would, I do have some thoughts here. So that thought had crossed my mind as well. At the same time, we're talking about a family who has lived here for many years, um, who has been very generous with the town. And I want to make sure that we are fair in our evaluation of what their land is worth. So I, it would feel very uncomfortable to me if we hold them hostage over the easement because it benefits us personally. Um, although I agree with you that we have a shortage of land. So I, I want to handle that carefully. Um, my other question is to this, so I was looking at your, uh, over your shoulder, Andy. Yeah. Um, it looks like that is currently undeveloped. That it, yes. the whole piece is undeveloped right now. So is there a conservation issue there where can we even, should we choose to purchase it, bulldoze what appears to be a very large swath of trees? Well, uh, I mean, there's a lot, I think there's a, there's a wetland in there, Bob. Um, it definitely is on the northern piece. I'm not sure if there's I think that, in the southern. The piece in question is dry. Yeah. But I'm, you know, that who knows until you actually bring yeah. that map up. But you know, um, yeah, just based on what I've seen of other adjacent land, yeah. that's tied out to the to the yeah. to the rifle club. Yeah. Yeah. So that uh, skin. So if they. <clears throat> Is this the parcel that it was discussed about the value of the parcel and the number of houses that could go on it, Bob? You know, um, it, 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 it could be yeah, the yeah, had highest and best use. Yeah, yes. the highest and best yeah. use. Yeah. In the appraisal. The appraisal. That, that discussion was going on. Uh, John, yeah. Yeah, I, I do have, I have, you know, a number of comments about this. First of all, um, this general area, um, this parcel being part of a of a much bigger um, piece of land that is mm -hmm. probably the last place that Reading has to develop recreation. I mean, honestly, there's a couple of choices that'll happen here. Um, if this property is sold, whether let's forget what the price is of the property. Yeah. Whether it's sold to the town or whether it's sold to a developer. Um, if a developer buys it, any number of things could go there, you know, ranging from, you know, commercial development to uh, pretty big 40B could go in that place, I'll tell you that right now. I mean, there's a lot of things that could happen there. Mm -hmm. um, there is currently um, a road that has, that's on the property with an easement held by the town. Um, I would suggest this, that before we start entering into who's going to buy what, where, and what's going to happen where, we do know that this is a, a piece of property that rightfully has had its access available during its useful business life to the Zani family. Um, and that's because they used it, they had that opportunity, it predates the government owning it, and granting it back. Um, I mean, the Zani family has been here 120 years, mm -hmm. you know, living here and developing the town. Um, furthermore, they had that option um, and were continuing to use it as part of their construction business. Um, 
did they make a mistake in the 1960s by not piggybacking on with the other privately held property? I think so. Um, was it intentional? I don't think so. Um, on either party, um, I think that they had rights and were using them. Um, and therefore, it didn't occur to anybody, either the town or to the, the Zani family at the time, that they would need to do this. Um, I would submit, kind of along the same lines as Vanessa has raised, you got to forget what's going to happen later. You got to do the right thing here, in my opinion. I do think that the town made a decision 50 years ago to do the right thing for a privately held piece of property that had been developed. and allowed an easement uh, you know the 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 participants at the uh, and members at the Reading Rifle Club transverse this freely and we'll always be able to transverse it freely freely because the town owns the easement and they further granted rights there um, I would suggest that this was an oversight 50 years ago um, and I think that you know, I would recommend to town meeting because this is going to come as a as a warrant to town meeting. This isn't for us to decide. Well, it's well, we have to, to we have to put it, it on the <coughs> warrant. No? If, yeah. if you if you, you I mean the ten residents can get together and petition the article, or the yeah. board can do it. Well, I mean, I guess where I'm coming from is I think it needs to get in front of town meeting, and the story needs done. For right. Well, that's, uh, that's ultimately the decision maker. You know, yeah. and yeah. so if if the the board of selectmen is are in a position to move that forward with due speed, I would strongly suggest we do that and I would support that. Um, as a member of town meeting who ultimately would be voting on whether to grant that easement at, yeah. at little or no cost, I think it it follows a protocol that has happened you know, over 50 years and that probably should have been done a long time ago. Um, and then once that's done and the property is going to find its value based on who the buyer is and you know I, I make no bones about the fact that I believe we are we do not have enough recreational developed recreationally developed land you know and that means not just baseball football across fields that means the opportunity for a new community center yeah, you know a, okay, a exactly. community center the basketball course. the opportunity for biking and hiking trails and Passive. finally Passive. to actually so, connect you know yeah. you know town conservation land that has been inaccessible in other ways mm -hmm. i think that there's a lot of opportunity here but that's not the discussion today um, the discussion is you know, if this is a potential warrant for the selectmen to put out there, I strongly encourage that we put it forward for consideration. The, e I would, the easement. Yes. Discussion. Yeah. yeah. So. The easement discussion. The, the request that's being made, you know. Um, there, so. Go ahead. Apologies. Um, I, I, I'd be curious if anybody had additional comments based on what was presented. Yes. Any public comments? Yes. So I'm Dresel, 130 John Street. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My only comments really are that the government took this property 50 years ago. They compensated the Zanis for the property at that time. They returned parts of the property back to Zanis when they decided they didn't need it. Uh, as for where we stand today, it's no longer the 60s or 70s. We have to do what is right for the town. I, I understand the Zannies have done a lot for the town over the years, but at this point, you're looking at a large buildable lot that more than likely will be a 40B if it's given access. They've already done it to their properties at the end of Lakeview and Eaton. Uh, it's the way to maximize the value of the property. So what you're looking at is what can the town, or what should the town get for this property? That is all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So at this point, Bob, do we, what is the ask of us, right? We don't, this is just a preview. We don't need to approve anything at this point, correct? Correct. Okay. In uh, four weeks by charter, you must close the warrant. Mm -hmm. um, I, I generally like to plan that with a storm date. So it's scheduled for your next meeting right. in two weeks. Um, either the board will vote to put this article on or not. 
and as I mentioned, uh, you know, it can be petitioned between now and then also. Sure. So, All right. So ten citizens can put something on the warrant. Yeah. Um, like, so. So it, the point being, it can find its way to town meeting in different ways. Yeah. Sometimes you sponsor things as a courtesy to other boards. Mm -hmm. We've done that before. Again, that's there are many paths to town meeting. Yeah. yeah. I, John. John. Yeah. I first of all, I think it would be the appropriate courtesy to extend to this request from this board. Obviously, we've got a little time. We've got a couple of meetings. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't sound like we're voting on. We're getting a preview of warrants, but I would. So I have two things to mention. One is that I do think we should push this forward as a as a warrant article from the board of selectmen. We'll decide that as time decides and when we get to that place. Yeah. The interesting thing, kind of tied to the public comment we just heard, that begs an interesting question. Um, so let's say, for example, that the town has no interest in owning this, which it may not. There may not be adequate funds to you know, further expand recreation. It may be the decision of town meeting, and uh, that's not a capital project that should be embraced. Let's think about the very thing that the public commenter just mentioned. What if a major development of any kind goes in there, whether it's a housing development or a commercial development? If this town meeting makes a decision to extend you know, an easement, what will happen is that will put that property in play for commercial development, which will put a lot of revenue potentially in play to this town, much more so than it's being, it's being taxed right now as vacant land. Um, we're not receiving, we're receiving peanuts for it today. And frankly, you know, if this easement doesn't come, there might not be encouragement on behalf of the Zani family to actually market the property, in which case it sits vacant, in which case, from a tax standpoint, we continue to get next to nothing. Yep. If that easement is present and the Zani family decides to market it, to whoever they decide to market it, if the town decides to buy it, fine, you pay a fair price. If a developer decides to you know, do it, that would be an encouragement, if I'm the owner of that property, to put it in play. If it goes into play, this town benefits from a revenue standpoint, no matter what. Uh, if we purchase it well, for recreation, that's one thing. Now it has economic benefit based on that. If we choose not to, and it goes into play commercially, then we've got the tax benefit. So in either direction, doing the right thing here and getting this easement put this property in its proper focus is I think a thing to be considered by town meeting and I would urge us to consider helping that process along. As, Vanessa, yes. As a point of clarification, John, I, I do want to mention that while yes, if this property is developed, we will benefit from a tax perspective, but there's also an associated cost, especially if this is a large housing development and it looks like an enormous property. So the there's a, there's a pro cons here list depending on how this gets developed that the town does realistically have an interest in. So, I from a what the public hears, I want to make it clear that it's not just about the tax revenue source. There's an associated cost to us for having God knows how many stories tall building well, in this location, yes. right? And it isn't. And if it gets developed and all of that land is cleared, there are butters there that would be affected as well. So. I, I want to make sure we're looking at this from a whole. Well, and, and I agree you have to look at the whole picture. The abutters are essentially the coyotes, but, you know. Now. Yeah, but beyond that, um, there's lots of ways to develop. I mean, we, for obvious reasons, we're very fixed on the fact that there's been a lot of housing development that's gone on. Okay. However, you know, it's a highly likely site. If I wanted to develop a commercial property, it's got great highway access and everything else. Commercial property brings along its own set of you know expenses, but they're very different for the town too. So to be considered is that where this is, how it could be developed, all of which brings, I think it routes it back to my original suggestion. I mean, if this develops as commercial property, 
I mean, this board has taken steps to be sure that we're on a path of a split tax rate. If it's developed commercially, then suddenly what happens is uh, there's more potential relief for the homeowners. So I um, just just sorry. You know, and I want to try to wrap this up soon, Barry. Yes. So I mean, when I read through the appraisal, the, the highest and best use was really housing. Is what is what when I when I read through the appraisal, and not, and not that that's necessarily bad. We we need more housing. I think that we can always go back, or we, I mean the town, can always put in or go and, and request an easement. But once the easement is done, we can't take back the easement. So, I mean, I appreciate the work that the Zanis have done in this town and, 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 and all the contributions that they've made. Um, but there's a lot of things kind of moving, moving it, it, in place. Um, if there's no easement and the town looks to try to do that, we can, I mean, there's nothing to say that we're not going to not pay a fair price. But once it has that easement, um, then it could be marketed to some things that we, you know, that, that we may or may not have control of. It would be, you know, commercial development, great, but the market will, t the, the town of Reading is not going to determine what's going to get built on that land. The market will. And so I think it's something that we should really think carefully about. Now, again, it's not this board that's going to make the decision. Would I vote to sort of put it in front of town meeting for town meeting to have that discussion? You know, more likely so. But right now, it, it, I, I'm not sure how I would feel about that. Um, I, I think that there's a lot of opportunity there, and 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 once you know, once you did, once you give it, it's done. And so I, I that's how I want to think about it. And you know, yeah. Um, Procedural question. Um, yes. Um, is uh, this is the first time I've seen something like this, um, especially one of this complexity? Bob, is there the possibility for granting an easement with conditions? I'm calling up for help in the back row. <laughs> Ray? In general, I would say the answer is yes. Um, whether you can make those conditions stand up in the face of the 40B development is another story. So, so oh, go ahead. And wow, I would really want to have to give you an opinion about that. But um, the, um, you, you know the 40B process is a unique beast unto itself. Yeah, we learned that. And um, uh, I, it's possible that the Housing Appeals Committee has said something on this subject about it. Right. But we can't say, oh, you can look at the easement if you use it for this, but not for that, right? We can't have a usage easement. Why not? Can we? Unless it's 40 B, it's I think in general you could. Again, subject to what might be done, uh, might be done in a 40 B process that would override that. But um, um, you can. If you're granting an easement, the easement can specify who may pass over it and for what purposes, actually. So I, 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 we need to wrap this up because, Ray, you need to speak uh, in, 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 a, in another minute. So I just, I'd like to, uh, one more. I think you got a comment here. Come uh, yes, two, comment. two comments. Okay, please keep them brief. Uh, I'll try. Uh, first, the uh, town council is here. I, I wonder if uh, this will ever a 40B, even in its current situation, mm -hmm. the easement existing having been granted to someone else other than the town, mm -hmm. if maybe that might be sufficient access for 40 k development right now. I'm just saying that as an aside. If someone was saying, hey, if you give this person permission, they're going to put a 40 b there. That's mm -hmm. was not the intention. But there's a question whether you can do a 40 b right now. But the real issue is... I, I, don't, I, I don't understand how that would be. You could you could sell it for a 40 b use right now? Well, there, there's a roadway there. There's a town-owned roadway. Yeah, but there's no easement there. That's the, well, not to the private party. But anyway, that, that's a side issue. The, the real issue is that I believe that you could put a Warren article on that gave a grant of the property to the, to the individuals requested on terms and conditions approved by the Board of Selectmen. 
That gives you a second bite of the apple. Uh, although, okay. Let's move back but, to the but, next question. Yeah, okay, more. And Tom Custer can comment on that. Really quickly, Mark Doctor Peter, just a question. Um, if an easement is granted, is it defined only as a nominal fee, period? That's the only option? Or could there be a different fee associated? Thank you. Uh, it, it's up to this. It's up, it's up to us. Uh, uh, so the reason I ask that is because I think the decision you need to make is more complicated than just put it on the warrant. Yeah. It's put it on the warrant at X. Yes. Right. Uh, which is right. the question I was well, going to ask Bob. Could, could you ask town just, council just, if it uh, has to say a precise amount or could it be right. a point I'm sorry. Um, Bob. I just also mentioned to the board that uh, if the board should choose, you do have executive session available for such topics. That is um, just to point that out. <laughs> very timely. Um, so <laughs> I, 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 I'll, I'll, I'd just like to say uh, two closing or a few closing words here. I hear what everyone is saying, what the board is saying about um, turning this into a, uh, a developed property that would bring in revenue for the town. I also understand. Um, that we have traffic problems in town. Um, some, I believe, have been on Haverhill Street. Um, so, so developing more usage of these roads, uh, there is a cost to that, and we're trying to balance a town um, that has good development, good economic development, with um, still maintaining a town feel. So I guess that's, that's all I'll say now. And um, Bob, thank you for the uh, idea of executive session. Can we do that next meeting? Um, well, yeah, I think we would have to if we want to get this on the town. Uh, uh, yeah, and as I say, I scheduled it for the next meeting. Um, by charter, you have two more weeks. This may right. be an instance where you really want to use it. And, yeah. And regardless of whether you just have to meet them. Yeah. Right. And then, yes. could, could we request Ray to be there with us? Yes, please. Uh, right. Request. <laughs> You want to come to our next meeting? I was just looking at my calendar. <laughs> I saw. I saw. And you maybe do we can do we That's can do the, the executive right. session in the beginning, so Ray doesn't have to sit here all night. Yeah. yeah. Correct. So is, is the board interested in the executive session? Yes. So I think we just need to be able to discuss yes. our options. Yeah. So so I let's move on. I will. Is, Bob but and I will is, is, but set it up. He's saying Ray. he's he's. I'm available on the twelfth. On the twelfth. Okay. So be it. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Ray. Um, and thank you to the uh, the gentleman for being so patient with our discussions. And the zombies. Yes. Yes. Um, all right. Now, Ray, are you ready to discuss Memorial Park? Yes. Here, you can sit here if you want. I'll move over. Yeah. I'll, no, I'll move over. Um, there are two files over here, the second and third ones. Okay. I'll go over here. I'll to toss my net pen in case I have anything brilliant to write down. <laughs> You better introduce yourselves for the audience at home. Sure. <laughs> so, um, most people know that you know me. I'm Ray Meares. I'm town council. With me is uh, a, uh, one of the lawyers from our firm, Brian Bertram, who is um, going to be working on town meeting. Um, this spring. Uh, he also had the pleasure of reviewing these documents um, that, um, uh, well, let's start with the, uh, the, the old one first, sure. Okay, so Memorial Park is the, uh, was the subject of a gift. 
it about a hundred years ago, mm. made to the town. Um, and um, all of the relevant documents, mm -hmm. that is the town meeting vote to accept the gift and the actual deed, mm -hmm. um, contain the information that land shall be improved and maintained as a public park, shall be laid out and ornamented with trees and shrubbery as a place for healthful rest, recreation, and amusement for people of all ages with proper facilities for such children's sports as can be generally indulged in by them and tend to their proper development and furnish them with amusement. Okay, so far We're so all good. Favor that. Yes. So we're in favor of that. But, says the next sentence, said land shall not be used as a playground for football, baseball, soccer, and kindred games. Kindred? Or kindred games. Mm -hmm. Or any games that are in their nature hazardous, or require fenced enclosures or tend to draw together crowds of people, or interfere with the quiet enjoyment of those whose homes are in the immediately neighborhood, or what it will do in relation there. Oh, we don't need that part. Okay, so, so, that is a, that is a restriction on the gift. The town, um, is not supposed to be using it as a playground for football, baseball, soccer, and kindred games. I'll take that to mean other kinds of games that require fields. Or any games that are in their nature hazardous. I don't really know what games that, other than football that, that might so be. So uh, Or require fenced enclosures. Or tend to draw together crowds of people, or interfere with the quiet enjoyment of those whose homes are in the immediate neighborhood. Okay, so mm -hmm. that's the restriction. Now, when land is given to the town as a um, gift with restrictions, it creates what's called a public trust. And that means that the town is legally obligated to um, honor the conditions of the gift. Um, unlike a commercial transaction that created restrictions, if they sold the land to the town with those restrictions, then it would be um, enforceable by um, someone who, has, who is in privity, that is, who, whose rights derive from whoever um, sold the, the property. Mm -hmm. But because they created a public trust, these restrictions are enforceable only by the Attorney General. Okay, so, um, in a hundred years, lots of things have happened on that property, and the Attorney General has, um, uh, the various Attorney Generals have distinguished themselves uh, um, by never taking the slightest interest in what goes on in that property. Uh, so that's an important fact to keep in mind. Okay, the second document uh, that we have here is a report of a, uh, is it there? Yeah, it's right here. Okay, so a report that was done by the Memorial Park Use Review Committee in 2004. That was a select board committee? It was yes. created by the select board and they had a variety of people that okay. it lists who's there, who was in it. And um, um, that committee, um, came up with a couple of recommendations. One, of, one important one was that uh, th that uh, in order to balance the interests of the various people involved, perhaps what we should do is um, allow practices to go on at that on that field, but not actual games. So school football team practices, okay. 
football games not okay. Uh, that is a distinction that they were sufficiently um, doubtful about that they um, asked then town council to pursue um, a uh, action in uh, court to uh, get that distinction memorialized in some sort of court order. Unfortunately, um, that bit of litigation was not successful. In order to, so there are two kinds of petitions you can have. And uh, boy, am I not an estate lawyer. Um, but there's something called the CPRE petition, which is a, um, a, a petition to alter the actual conditions of a gift. Um, and then uh, the other one is called an equitable deviation, wh um, which um, is uh, does not alter the purposes of the gift, but the means of its implementation. It's a very subtle legal distinction. Thankfully, I have never had to be involved in uh, in uh, either one. Um, okay. That said. Both of them require the same thing, which is that you have to demonstrate to the satisfaction of the court that the, uh, it is impossible to comply. And that's where the lawsuit foundered in, uh, in 2005, I think it was 2007. 2007, okay, in 2007. Um, uh, because it's really not impossible to comply. We just, just wanted exactly. want to do something different. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So we are left with a sort of uneasy truce, which is um, um, there are uh, uh, in place some observed restrictions on the use of that property that don't necessarily correspond exactly uh, with the terms of the gift, but which have been going on for many years without the Attorney General necessarily being um, uh, concerned about it. Um, so, if you were going to ask me what to do, I would say the usual practice of these things is if, as long as the person who is responsible for, um, uh, for enforcing doesn't seem to mind, you should just carry on until such time as they do. If you say, um, uh, if the question is, can we now um, Add new uses there to, uh, to make the deviation, the distinction between what's going on there and what's uh, authorized by the gift, even greater. I would caution against that. Yes. So, so okay. there we are. So, can I ask? A, a yes, Barry. Go ahead. So, what's what's prompting this discussion now? I mean, are there? I, I don't believe there are any um, requests to sort of expand the uses by some of the groups in town, and, and I don't, and there may be, I don't know, are there complaints about what's being used now, or, or, or is this just sort of, we're trying to clean something up as opposed to someone's trying to do something or more that we need to make a decision on, or, or, or there are complaints about the current use. I, I just need to understand that. Andy, yeah, I'm sorry. Bob. That's okay. Um, I thought you were going to speak in my mind. I had already. <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> <laughs> um, I wasn't here in 2004, but I was in 07, so I, I was familiar slightly with the discussion. At that time, there was both neighborhood resistance and desire to increase. So there was both pieces, which brought the discussion more to the front. Mm -hmm. Um, in particular, one of the neighbors who was offended by the current use at the time has since moved. And I'm not aware of any request that continued past the failure in 2007. Not to say the town is always interested in more recreational space generally. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I have not seen, and I, I tried to catch up to Jenna today, she was out. Um, our recreation administrator, um, whether there's specific inquiry from a group that wants to use it that can't. I shouldn't think so. Yeah. Not to say it wouldn't come. If town council had said, 
we could entertain new uses, I dare say you'd get a list. Right, right. But there's, so basically, there's no decision making here that we need to. Do no, with Bill, Bill Brown had asked through town meeting an instructional motion for this to be pursued. John? Well, I don't think that there's any question that if there was a thought that we could set aside this restriction or um, go forward with an action that you described at the very tail end. There is absolutely no question that there would be, there is pent up demand to use that space. That space was used for, I would say, at least 50 years for children to play on it um, in, in, in baseball practice and softball practice and you know, not lacrosse because it hadn't hit town yet, but you know, that was utilized never as the place to play a game out of respect for the way that that restriction was put on there. But certainly, I mean, the ability for these teams to have any practice space at all doesn't really exist any longer since we had one neighbor who decided that he was going to challenge how recreation was allowing that to be used. That space was being used without assignment. In other words, you could go down there, find a little corner, you know, with seven-year-olds and, you know, throw some plastic bases down and, and practice. And that's what was going on. I mean, essentially, that's what was going on for decades. Yeah. Um, now, no one has asked because as a result of the 07, was like, get back in your corners, you right. can't use it for this. Yeah. Now, you know, I would say, if you read the first one and the second one, I guess we gotta tear down the tennis courts and the basketball courts, because those are fenced in, <laughs> okay? I, I'm saying that um, I respect that you're suggesting let the sleeping dog lie, right? Mm -hmm, that's exactly okay. Right. And that's fine if that's what we're going to do. But we got to recognize that you know we've had certain citizens, and then we had town meeting issue an instructional motion to get to the bottom of this thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the bottom is not a place we want to be. Okay. <laughs> um, and if we get to the bottom of it, and you know, satisfy the insatiable need. Um, that we have for a very small amount of citizens to come to some resolution, then I think we got to start to consider, say, pray. We got to consider all of the other things that you know are involved in this. And I, I, I hesitate to want to go there. And I, I get the sleeping dog is is lying, and that's great. But well, to be clear, that's where they went after in, after the 2004 report. And in 2007, that resulted in uh, in failure. So, I, so this already has been to the court and failed. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, what, what, um, let, Vanessa had a, had a question. Yeah. I'm sorry. So, I agree. We were we have a limited amount of land, and we have a lot of demand for recreational space. Yep. However, my concern here is. Um, I don't want to poke the beast because we do have things there that could potentially extend the original intention of this. So if we push our luck, we may be faced with sacrificing things that we already have. Well, the beast has been poked. So yes, but then we, it sounds like we quietly retreated, right? Right. So, right. so, so I, you know, I, I feel the pain. I, j I just hesitate to go down this road. Well, I'm not suggesting we do. I'm just saying, yeah. you know, we have acquiesced, not acquiesced. We've followed the instruction of town meeting, and here we are. Yeah. And Jeff, you know, Jeff, John, I, I think, but I want to make sure I keep okay moving along. Vanessa, you've finished. What's the ask here? Yeah, that's what I. That's what I wanted. To okay, my, that was my question. Okay, okay. Uh, I stole it. Uh, well, the ask from town meeting is what? Are, what is the allowed use? I think Ray's given us that right. allowed use. Mm -hmm. um, we Ray's just don't give you some guidance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> you read the original, yeah. yeah. It seems I read, like I what, read it out loud. what we have here is, is a situation where 
there's been there is this public trust mm -hmm. that has not been followed for, for the past 50 years or so. Probably, had, or and you more. start looking at the history of it, it seems as though the, the breaches started almost instantaneously. Instantaneously. That, that is, right. there are examples of what, of, you know, of baseball being played on, on their newspaper articles. In, in the 20s. Right. Right. In, the, in the 20s, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 yeah, and I, and I certainly um, coached uh, my kids in soccer when they were knee high to a grasshopper on, on those fields. Mm -hmm. So, um, they're used for, it's not just baseball, there's also soccer. And um, so, so where does that put us, Ray? Really, I mean, it, 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 well, it's, for every right there. So this, the only enforcement of this provision, yes, is by the attorney general, right? Who I have to think has better things to do with her time. Yes. Um, um, so I can't tell you that the Attorney General will, you know, never take an interest in this, but um, I, I think um, um, it, it seems to me to be a little bit unlikely. Yeah. Um, now, you know, I can't advise you to um, disregard um, what the law requires. Right. I can just tell you that if you um, if you carry on and maintain a low profile, chances are the Attorney General will never just take an interest in this. I can tell you that. I generally, you know, I, I, I am very hesitant not to follow a, a public trust or, or a law um, because there's an unlikelihood that someone will come after us. Um, I mean, there, there was a public trust created. However, it was broken about as, uh, as before, just before the ink was dry, so to speak, on this. So, I, yeah, uh, Barry, please. So, I mean, this is not the this is not the first time that the town um, entered into a public trust you know, with with a generous family. A hundred years ago, I mean, we we had I think actually not a hundred years ago, but I think in the twenties and thirties, a, a wealthy family donated money to the town for us to build a hospital. Well, um, clearly, in 2019, we are not going to build a hospital in the town of Reading. However, the trust fund commissioners went to the court to get a side prey agreement that basically said, what, what it kind of says is like, what they really meant, you know, in the, in, in, the, in the future is that, can we use these other uses, which kind of have the same benefit without us having to actually build a physical structure of a hospital and the, and the, and the town went and, 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 and we prevailed. And so now those trust funds help bring the elderly to their doctor's yeah, appointments right. and, and those kinds of things. It's, the, it's, it's sort of the same spirit of that. Um, you know, it sounds like the town sort of went and tried that again with this in 2004, or was it 2007, I'm sorry. Yeah, the decision uh, was. The decision was. Right, so, so if it went in 2004 and they in 2007? Something like that. Well, well, that ought to tell you that that was not on the, high, the priority list. Um, and, 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 and we didn't prevail, so, you know, to try that again, you know, even though there's a, a need for that, I'm not sure is necessarily a great idea. On, on the other hand, I do, I do believe that, you know, there are people who are sitting right now, maybe watching this, who are thinking about leaving a sum of money for the town for a public trust. Um, and if we willy-nilly just sort of say, well, thank you, we're really going to do this now, I think that's kind of a, a violation. I think what you're advising is kind of that, that, that middle ground. We can't go back and ask this family from 100 years ago what they really would been, and would you really want us to do this now? We can't. We just sort of have to interpret it and do our best as stewards of that trust to kind of manage it in a way that mm -hmm. um, that maintains that, but at the same time, you know, responds to sort of modern day kinds of things. And I think what just what you're suggesting is probably the best path. So, the difference between the story you just told about the hospital and this story is that we're not um, we're not proposing to take the park in. And, and use it for something other than a place of health, rest, recreation, and amusement. We're, we're, 
the first sentence is all fine. It's the sentence that, that the, the, the restrictions that we're having trouble with. And, um, you know, if, if at, at, at some point um, an enforcement proceeding were brought against the town by the Attorney General because we've got fenced enclosures, pretty hard to say we don't. Um, but, um, you know, as far as, um, as, as a playground for football, baseball, soccer, the, uh, the idea that, that we only use it for practice and not for games, you know, maybe, maybe we could defend ourselves. I think you um, the, um, the absence of somebody who is really pushing to, to further restrict what, what goes on there, um, it, it just feels as though um, you should take in, into consideration what the Attorney General is likely to do. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like it's found its level. Oh, Bob has a question. Bob. Um, Barry used a, a good example I was thinking of, and, and it, do, it was germane at the time when the town considered going for a site prey on this, because some people involved had been successful in the Hospital Development Trust Fund. Mm -hmm. And they argued, well, what did you really mean back when you gave the gift? What did those words mean then versus mm -hmm. what they would mean now? And one of the arguments was uh, baseball in the 1910s and 20s was done by hooligans. <laughs> and it's, it's very different today. <laughs> I, I have a picture of that. Yeah. I mean, the <laughs> County. And, mm -hmm. and the meaning of some of the words that we recognize is quite different 100 years later. And that was the argument. And as you know, it all comes down to what judge you get and what the interpretation the judge makes. And the hospital one. Um, they agreed that medicine had changed and that the meaning in 1910 of the word hospital could be very different today. So there was a slightly expanded use. The judge so in this case, decided it did not. In this case, the judge seemed to be hung up with interfere with the quiet enjoyment right. of those homes right. in the immediate right. neighborhood. And, 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 and in fact, he held a hearing in which neighbors were asked whether this interferes with their quiet enjoyment. So it sounds like... The Attorney General was invited to participate in this. Mm -hmm. I don't think they did. Okay. did they, in 2007? Yeah. I believe they did. Yeah. And, the, and ultimately when there was a butter uh, protest, the Attorney General didn't support it. That's my memory. I have the actual I'm sorry, can you repeat yeah. that just a little, little more loudly for the... I'm running on memory. I haven't looked at the document myself, but I understand the Attorney General did participate because they have to be a proceeding in the CPRA petition. Uh -huh. And that once the abutting neighbors um, opposed CPRA, that the Attorney General didn't support it in that proceeding, which okay. is one of the reasons yeah. why it sort of fell apart. Yeah, I, and the so town did try to pursue the relatives of the gift giver uh -huh. uh, for two years and just couldn't. Couldn't find it. Yeah. Andy, can I? Yes, yes. And then, and it's, then. It sounds like what we were tasked with from town meeting was identifying the situation we're in now, the original intent of the gift, and how we propose to move forward, correct? So if that's the case, we need to report back at the April town meeting um, essentially what Ray has there just summarized. Um, and then if there are any actions that this board plans to take on how to proceed with how we are using the field space, the, the park now. So I, I'll be honest, I don't live in that park town. I don't know how the space is used. Are there things in order to be in compliance with the original gift that we need to do? I'm not sure who I'm addressing that to, but can I add on a, a, or sure. sort of uh, hone that question into what is it being used? What is the park being used for now? I was. I need to check with recreation formally, but I'm not aware that they scheduled the field like John said. I don't think it, it's you. It's, it's one other of that. It's just pick up. You know, you know right. that's. I think the tennis courts well okay. have some schedule to them okay and they are fenced yeah there are basketball yeah, courts there so they are fenced no look <laughs> the I demand see. that was made by town meeting 
pokes the beast. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I mean, and I'm not, and, I, and I'm not suggest, I'm not, I'm not offering that we should go to court. What I'm saying is, we got to understand what I mean. The whole purpose of this, you know, we had a handful of citizens who got in front of town meeting and got an instructional motion created a lot of work for both of you and we now have the story the story is we've been breaking the rules since 1921 okay it was handed in, to us in different ways in, in very different ways at different times but there has been matches contesting you know. mm -hmm. okay including the roving bands of hooligans playing baseball in the field that seems to have been going and you know in those days it, frankly i mean you could look around at these things there were baseball teams every town had a team and they were hooligans and they would this guy didn't want them there okay i get it okay so but the point is we, we need to make a report to town meeting right yeah. on what we plan to do so we know what we've learned the question is what are we as our board going to do if if there's some amount of scheduling, the facilities are there, we can't... Well, okay, let me take a step back. What if we were to determine that one member of this board would draft um, a report back to town meeting and the rest of the board could approve said yeah. statement, right? Because it, it needs to come from us. We were tasked with this as a board. Yeah. But we need to come up with something to put in front of them. Uh, or is, is, one, is, is it an option that the board takes no action? Yeah, Barry, I, that, I, that, that's, I, I think we have to say something to tell me. But, we have to tell but, them. But, but, right. but, 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 but I think taking an action could, could get us in, you know, saying that um, the town or the board of selectmen think this should be, this you should be allowed, this you should be allowed, I, 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 I think we should stay away from that. Um, rather, could we simply find out what it's used for now, present what you gave us mm -hmm. and say this is the this is this this is the uh, public trust this is what has been happening since 1921 and this is there was a, 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 a some court action in 2007 um, that we did not win and so now it's used for this and that's our report and then we can also add on top of that and the, and the board recommends no further activity above and beyond what's being used now. yes how does that right who's going to do that Fine. How about Dan? He's not here. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Ray. You're already practically Dan won't be here when we're in <laughs> town meeting. Yeah. Sorry, Dan. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot he expired. Yeah. Um, Dan has an expiration. I'd be happy to write that unless you're already in the state of the union. I'm doing the state of the union. Uh, yeah, but that's it, it's a, it's three paragraphs. Yeah. yeah. And you know, look, it, it's just being used pretty much the way that it's laid out there. Yeah. Right. With uh, some notable yeah. exceptions. Yeah. Uh, and I can right. find out. I mean, we do flood it. We light it. Use. There yeah. are. If I mean, there are things we do to it. Yeah, you know, cause it to be used passively. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so I mean, if the board is, if the board is okay, so I, 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 yes. But I mean, I can do it. You can do it. It's fine. Okay. All right, that's great. You um, Is the board okay with Vanessa writing up what working with town manager to find out what it's used for? I mean, I'm happy to run it. No, yeah, I'm gonna yeah. I mean, do we get? I mean, if it, uh, and then you're going to pass the board yeah. next meeting. It's right. fine. Okay, yeah. good. That's fine. Don't commit me to next meeting. Yes. But yes. Okay. I, well, before uh, town meeting. Before town, it's got to go. Yeah, before well, town but meeting. But the report doesn't mind. have yes, to be yes, done. Right, right. Before the word Correct. is no. signed. No, no, yes. right. we, I, we have we, until right before. Just tell me the wording you want under reports. That's all we need for closing the warrant. It'll just, it'll just be, actually, it'll just actually, be uh, that, really. report back on the instructional motion yeah. on Memorial Park. Yeah, yeah. excellent. Okay. Okay. Great. Move on. Ray, thank you very much. Um, are we releasing Ray next? Yep. Uh, Bob, um, if, 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 it, if it's okay with the board, um, we have the, um, the chair of the school committee tonight, uh, Elaine, who is patiently waiting for something we were going to discuss at 945. Um, does anyone object to... Um, if we move the signing of the Oakland Road map for the uh, for the yeah. registry of deeds to after no, the school, take it out, right. take it out of motion. Take my order. Huh? T let's go. Take it out. Take it right. out of order. Let's take go. my order. Okay. Taking it yeah. out of order. Okay. I'll be right back. Yep.
Do you want us to take a break, or do you want to start with that? No, we'll be right back. Yeah, okay. we'll, we'll, let, we'll let it Okay, so I'm trying to introduce. We're not taking a break. Um, John said to continue. Oh, he did? Yes. Okay. Oh, all right. Yeah, when they reconvene or whatever, yeah. So you're going to introduce this? Or? Yes. All right, go ahead. Okay, so, um, okay. You want to say, Bob? Uh, we'll wait for John. John said we should continue with that and he'll be right back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so, so. Can you pass that piece of paper to Andy? Um, right. So I'd like to. I asked first a little very brief history. You know, there's an opening on the school committee um, that, or, or I'm sorry, a school committee member resigned recently, and um, I asked Bob to give a presentation on the process f um, of what happens after the school committee member resigns, and the first step in that process, Elaine. Uh, just handed me here, which I will re read. Thank you very much, Elaine, um, and welcome uh, to our meet. You can uh, sit up. Front. You can sit up front. Or I was watching the whole previous part. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Get out of your PJs and get dressed at the right time. Yeah. So um, this is dated January twenty second, two thousand nineteen. To Andrew Friedman, chairperson. Reading Select Board RE vacancy on the Reading School Committee. Uh, on January 17th, 2019, the Reading School Committee voted to authorize the School Committee Chairperson to inform the Select Board of the vacancy which occurred on January 7th, 2019. This written notification is provided in person to the Select Board Chairperson on January 22nd, that's today, 2019. Elaine Webb, Chairperson, Reading School Committee, and she has copied uh, the Superintendent of Schools, John Doherty, and the Town Manager, uh, Bob Lillisher. Thank you very much, Elaine. So, uh, right, I'd like to pass this over to Bob. Uh, he, he had agreed to give a, uh, a brief walkthrough of uh, the process now. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I can skip uh, much of it because Elaine has just chosen a path, so we don't need to wonder if she hadn't. Um, can I see this? Yes. The fact that the school committee has formally notified you puts you now into the position of um, holding a meeting to determine if you're going to fill it or not. I mean, town council can help. The statute clearly does use the word shall. Yes. You shall hold a meeting. You shall fill the seat. Yes. But as town council will tell you, there's no consequence if you don't fill the seat. So it's another one of those trust issues, I guess you might boil it down. Thank from. you. Um, the school committee, as I understand it, has not taken any action as to what, what their desire is, whether you fill a seat or not. Presumably, if I, I was there a vote? Oh, yeah, I'd like comment to. that the, all of the members certainly feel that it's really not very practical because by the time we could execute this process, there's one school committee meeting on March 21st um, that the person would basically be appointed for, and then would would not be at the next meeting unless they also uh, were running at the papers and were running election and won. Yeah. So so this so, appointment so this appointment is doesn't mean. Sorry. I, I, I just I'm trying to keep it to people uh, getting. So the, sure. the school committee certainly can have an opinion, and the select board can acquiesce to the opinion or do whatever the select board wishes. Right. Yes. So um, if you were to get together as a committee of two fives, you have a ten. Yeah. Six votes are required for any action, so there has to be someone from another board. <laughs> right, split it that way. Um, there's a certain amount of time that um, now that Elaine has taken the step that the vacancy would need to be advertised for. Um, logistically, certainly, uh, it could be February 12th that you could have a joint meeting. I'll have to look at the math to see if you could join the school committee at one of their existing scheduled meetings mm -hmm. sooner than that. Um, I certainly take Elaine's point as the practicality, and, and just let me get this clear, because it's happened, unfortunately, a couple times. Um, an appointment made in this order 
Um, some people have viewed it as political and an advantage to someone. And if it's an advantage to be on the school committee, to run for school committee, perhaps by itself, that's true. There's no advantage on the ballot. You are not listed as an incumbent. Mm -hmm. um, Can you clarify why that is? State law. You, you were not. You were never elected to the position. Right. Thank you. Um, and I know that was a few years back. I forget honestly who, who left, and I remember that was a surprise. It's, uh, it's yeah. also been. I consulted. You've had vacancies like November, December, as right. opposed to February. Right. So um, I consulted with our MASC field director, and that was one of the scenarios in which um, sometimes people actually delay their resignations yes. or put a. Uh, forward date on it to avoid giving the committees the ability to appoint someone post election. But I, I just want to say, while members individually felt that this is not practical, we did the only vote that the committee yeah. made was just to tell you that there's a vacancy. Right. So I just I, want to make sure that yeah, that's. And I understand the reasons. Right. For that. So I, I believe that you know Ray, tell me if I'm wrong, that you are obliged to have this joint meeting at this point. That, so to be clear, it's, it's a shell. It kind of looks like a joint meeting. Okay. But it is a select board meeting at which individual members of the school committee have a right to participate and to vote. So that's different. So you don't need a quorum of the school committee right. to be present. You just need... You need one. You need it. You just need yes. um, six votes. So, however many, uh, however many people are present, to get you six say, votes. say we yeah. need an applicant too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Be Barry, before you ask your question, I just want to specifically just nail you down on one thing. <laughs> it says <laughs> it says we shall. Yes. But does it say within what time frame? Uh, does it say within the seven, yes, seven, uh, seven days? After, after one week's notice, that's what it says. Just after. Okay, so <laughs> after one week's yeah. notice. Okay, Barry, thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Thanks, for Thanks for the Thanks for me. Yeah. So, uh, to be clear, if this were to, uh, if we were to appoint someone to replace Sherry, that wouldn't take that person to the remaining two years of her term. They would have yeah. to run in in a couple of weeks. That's okay. correct. So, I mean, I, I know since I've been on the board, um, I, I've sat in on two of those. Um, one, when we actually appointed Nick, um, and that was when Julie resigned. And then again, a year or two later, I forget what it was last year, that we appointed Sherry. Both of those times were sort of late fall before you guys got the budget, right? And, and so, in both in override years, by the way. Um, and so you needed the help, right? I mean, there, uh, oh, well, I mean, you could have gotten by with five, but you know, you had a budget to deliberate. To my understanding that even if we do everything by the book, right, advertise and everything like that, by the time that person um, is appointed and sits, the, your budget's out of committee already. Yeah. Yes, we're going to vote on our budget on January 28th. And there's only one, and there's only other, one other meeting. And then that person then has to go out and win on April 2nd, assuming there is someone that actually comes up and wants to, to do right. the job. It is a rigorous process, right. I think, John right. was pointing out. So mm -hmm. does this board then have, have to have a meeting and just to, to have the meeting and then at that meeting we can decide we don't want to fill the position or if we just decide right now that given just the impracticality of it you know we don't want to fill the position either so i mean what, can i what, so i i just like i asked, asked that question i'd like that answered by somebody so i have a oh, wait, so wait, question. wait i think do you, he wants his answer right before question, we jump to the next answer. question right yeah okay so um There is a, um, a multi-volume uh, set of books called Sutherland Statutory Construction that, uh, oh boy. Um, that lawyers love to uh, uh, <laughs> refer to. And in, there, in it, it says that the word shall um, has 31 different meanings, uh, uh, depending on how it's used. But, um, uh, but the most common thing 
that you see is shall like this, um, where uh, there is no consequence specified if you don't. So what that means is if you if if the word shall in this case means that uh, the only remedy um, would be for someone who has standing and. Um, truly don't know who would have standing, mm -hmm. but someone who is uh, have standing would go to court and get a court order directing you to conduct the vote, at which point it would be already right. too late yeah. to do it. Right. So um, the consequence, so, so I would never say shall means may, but in this particular yeah. circumstance, it's pretty close to may because there's no consequence right for failure to do it. It doesn't say, and if you don't do it, then then the school committee can pick their own, or the, the seat has to remain vacant, or yeah. you know, none of those things are specified in the statute. So if you, so, um, so you're, you certainly um, uh, can keep in mind that there is no remedy for your failure to do it, and therefore it's what is considered in the law to be to be directory. It tells you what you should do, but okay. but so it's thank not you. My in the, it's not mandatory in the sense of you, you know there are some serious consequences if you if if you didn't do it. Vanessa and then John. So. I appreciate, Ray, you pointing out the technicality of, of the fact that there are no consequences. Mm -hmm. um, if my son steals a candy bar and he doesn't get caught, is it still okay? So... Oh, this isn't that. You're not being, it's not a matter of being caught. You, whatever you're going but to if do we're, is... But if, yeah. if we're not called to the table, right? I mean, that's that's essentially what's happening. We, there is a... St and, and I appreciate the fact that this is inconvenient, that the timing is unfortunate, that it's a ludicrous amount of work um, for what it's going to amount to one meeting, two if we're lucky. However, the state law indicates that this is something we are required to do. Simply because there is no consequence does not mean that we should look at it as optional. Because my concern here is that there is probably any number of laws on the books that don't specifically have a consequence. That doesn't mean we have a right to choose which ones we follow. John. I think we have to point out that there is a person of standing who has sent us a letter today, a member of the school committee, asking us to do our duty. What was that? Yeah, Nick. I yeah. think you can't Next overlook step. that. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I don't know why. I, I think, so Mr. Bobbin is also an attorney. He's a patent attorney, and yet he's, if you didn't see, I don't know if Ray saw the letter, but um, it's that's his personal opinion and interpretation of the law and the word shell, and I just heard um, Attorney Nieri say that there's 31 meanings. So this is certainly, you know, I... I, yeah, I, I Elaine, I'm not trying to take a side here. I'm just pointing out... But I thought that when Mr. Attorney Mayoris was talking about a person of, of standing in the process would be someone who felt that they were potentially treated unfairly by not getting the opportunity to be appointed for one meeting. I, I, that was my uh, own assumption of, of his statement of a person of standing. This certainly, and um, it, it would really be one meeting because I, I would like to say I understand that it's a meeting of the select board and like the school committee members get to participate in that. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that in the past, I've been through this process probably five or six times right. and in every case the meeting was scheduled so that the committee members could attend and I can tell mm -hmm. you that the five of us who are currently on the committee would absolutely want to attend any meeting that is going to impact our board so it would have to be scheduled to make sure that the committee members would, could attend so uh, Barry so let's just say we follow through and schedule a meeting Right, and you know, for the purposes of appointing someone for the one meeting for the for, you know for, to fill out Cherry's term um, until election day. No, right, yeah. to, to, okay. So, Ray, am I? Is it true to understand that it would take six votes? It would take six votes. So, not not a, not not on a majority of the people who show up. That is correct. So, if we scheduled a meeting and there weren't six people there. 
you know, <laughs> and there's not votes. Does it say so, I mean, it's part of the oh. reason. Part of the reason. That's okay. I mean, <laughs> you gotta be no, kidding. No, no, I'm just saying yeah, is that is that there's no, there's, there's no, there, I mean, whoa, whoa, whoa. Th there's right, the practicality of a pl of appointing somebody for 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 one meeting. I think everybody on its face seems that that's not. No. That's not a wise use of time. Whereas people can then go out, take their nomination papers, get on, and get on the ballot, and and run. But that's right. not the question before yeah. us. So I, I just just okay. So we got to raise our hands because the rest things are gonna um, um, fly. All right, fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to do it, but Vanessa. Um, so I, I don't want to I don't want to game the system. Um, as far as intentionally scheduling, it's that we don't have members of the school committee there, um, or enough of them, or enough people to make a legitimate vote, right? That that seems um, uh, insincere. Um, I don't like this any more than anybody else does. It means an additional meeting, a lot of work, and they serve for, and we may not even get any applicants. That's the other part of it, right? Who wants to subject themselves to that for one meeting? But that's not the question before us. The question before us is that state law indicates that we need, we shall appoint someone. 31 meetings aside. And, and that's what I indicated was I thought was the best approach. It's, you know, do we go through this process or do we choose simply not to act, in which case perhaps there is someone out there that would want to apply and then they do sue us. Um, I, I don't know if that's a risk worth taking. Um, John, did you want to say something? I, I really, I understand the challenge, but I agree with what Vanessa's saying. I, you know, look, if somebody's out there and they want to do it, Let's accommodate us. And if and if we if we call a meeting, look, you can have a party and nobody shows up. That happens. And I'm talk, when I talk about nobody showing up, I'm not talking about the elected members in in that are concerned here, which are certainly the five school committee. And I I get it, Elaine. You guys would certainly want to be involved. Absolutely, I get that. Um, and we should all show up too. But. You know, you kind of have to make a decision tonight to go forward with that process and yeah. then need to see what happens. I mean, we, as I said earlier, nobody has run to the clerk's office to pull papers for this position. As a matter of fact, as I understand it, there are, there will be three positions open on the school committee and one set of papers has been pulled. So far, is that true? Some people have disclosed some things about timing, I believe. But I whatever. I mean, you know, yes, I believe. Who's ever no doing what they're doing? They're doing it. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. It's but I, I guess what the point is is that I think we've got an obligation. If there's a citizen out there that would like to apply for this job on an interim basis, mm -hmm. to create that platform, and let's see what let's see if there is such a person. Could I could I weigh in here j just um, to <laughs> uh, thank you, Bob. Um, <laughs> you don't have to raise. It. <laughs> um, I, I, I want to address John and Vanessa because um, I, I I totally understand your point. Um, it says shall shall mean shall, and um, evidently there's no wiggle room on the time frame. Thank you, Ray. Um, but the, uh, from from in working, having worked with state government for eighteen years or so, um, our laws and regulations have a lot of shells, and um, there are times when, and I can't, I'm not speaking for the state in this case. But there are times when the, the state does, does, does just does not pursue every shall because it's totally impractical. Um, I'm not saying it's impractical here, but I think uh, I'd like to just share that with you. And I, I think there is, it does seem a little... 
more than in practical. It seems like a little bit of a, a big show for a one meeting, and then we have an election. Um, and I, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm. I'm. I'm comfortable in, engaging in that. Um, because of, uh, of of what it would mean, it would appoint somebody to the school committee for one meeting. And Mr. Chair, can I ask so, another co clarifying question? Yes. So let's just say, because we want to follow the letter and the rule of the law, we schedule a meeting. Um, so, you know, hopefully someone shows up, but let's just say someone shows up. Does that require us to appoint that one person, or does that just require us to listen to that person's no. reason for why they want to apply, and then we can vote yes or no? Who are you asking? We just, I'm asking somebody. We just have to vote. I, I spend, spend, okay. right, I'm asking, I'm, I'm Bob, no, asking the ether. Bob, they have to get six votes. Bob. Um, you can appoint any registered voter, whether they applied or not. You don't have to appoint someone because they applied. Consent is not required here? We can appoint someone ESLA. So I, I have been through the appointment process myself, my very first time on the committee back in 2003, uh -huh. and I've done it multiple times. I think it's an actually it's an excellent process. It's really rigorous. If you want to be appointed, the application is like you're filling out your resume. Right. You sit here. It's a public process. It's pretty stressful. So somebody who wants to be appointed to the committee, it's a very serious, and I think it's a it's a big investment on their part. Whether someone's going to want to go through that for one meeting, that person is ultimately going to have to decide that. I just think also, as with your board, with our board, there's there's a number of things that um, either the chairperson and or the superintendent, I assume it's the chairperson or, or, or Bob as town manager, basically provide to that person to sort of get them up to speed to get them started. <laughs> And so that is a, an amount of resources also that would need to be expended for potentially someone to be on the board for one meeting. I mean, yes, we would do whatever it is we need to do for that person if that was, if that was the decision. But it just in terms of the practicality issue of it, it, it's just another piece of it. Vanessa said she had a question. I have a procedural question. Okay, I, I don't know if this is for Bob or Ray. All right, we have seven days since notification just means we have to do it today to decide whether or not we want to post this position correct this opening all right that's seven days um, no. no 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 we have seven, seven days, days from that's not the way it's written so someone someone clarify the the actual process for when we need to have the meeting to a point we have to have it within 30 days so so you have a process for filling for filling all appointment positions right. and it involves posting it for 15 days 15 days okay it's right in the it's right in the charter thank you Bob. yeah all right and it's right in the charter yes. okay so so like a couple of water days. <laughs> so we we have, have to post. post it for 15 days okay you also have to give notice at least seven days before when of the date that that you're going to take a vote so that, that's that date that you take a vote can't be sooner than 15 uh, 15 days because we have to post it you have to post it right but then you have you ha you can't just give the normal uh, 48 hours notice that we put it on the agenda uh, you have you have to in fact um, give public notice that the vote is going to take place seven days ahead of the meeting so that's where the seven day, so the seven day <laughs> comes in. Yes. Is that right? So right. technically, though, we could. You could still do that on the eighth. You know, on the fifteenth day. Well, we're still within, right? Right. But yeah. so we have to post for fifteen days, and we have to say we have to announce it seven days in advance. However, we don't have to necessarily schedule the meeting. Do we have to schedule the meeting when we vote within a certain time frame? You have to schedule the meeting. Right. So if if. At a minimum, we can't we we cannot do it any sooner than 16 days, because mm -hmm. that's the posting period, right? right. No, but I, the seven can be posted. We can post before we actually inside the 15 days. Yeah. So okay, that's that's the short end, right? Wait, wait, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I want to make sure I get that. Yep. We have to announce the meeting six days prior. Seven. Seven days, seven days prior. We have to post for two weeks. 
um, you could today, and those overlap. For example, yes. Yes. Okay. You could today, for okay. example, say. But that's the short. We're going end. to take this vote on whatever February twelfth. February twelfth. You could announce that today. Okay. That satisfies the seven-day requirement. That's great. What's the long end of that? Do there we have? No long end. That's it. So there's no. Well, we, we have can to schedule a meeting. Thirty no. days. No. Or we have no. 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 I thought they have to tell us in thirty days that there's a vacancy. Yeah, that's, right. Right. Which they just that's did. been done already. Which they, they did right. their part. But no, I'm trying to figure out if there's a vacancy. Oh, uh, boy, this is a hard one to uh, 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 moderate. Go ahead. I have a question for Ray. Um, how does the board give seven days' notice except at a posted meeting? Well, the same way that they give 48 hours' notice. So, um, so it can be done through the chair. <laughs> through the chair, yes. Okay. Just want to make sure. Yes. Don't vote without me. I won't. I won't. <laughs> yes. um, so the chair can decide this is an agenda item seven days in advance instead of 48. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure. The, uh, anyway, um, it's, <laughs> my my point was: is there is there an outer limit? And the answer is no. No. It's all part of the strange and wonderful definition of the word "shall." Yeah. yeah. I mean, so, John, I'm curious what your thoughts are on this because you and I seem to be aligned <laughs> generally on the. I mean, I, I'm torn here, right? So. The, Respectfully ask that John and I, I have, no have a side control. conversation while, while there is a way. Um, I'm, I'm torn here, right? We, we have the law as interpreted, right? Um, there's room, you know. Are you asking my for, opinion? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything that this is simply impractical, but I want to make sure that we're not taking liberties with the law. So I'm, you know. You and it, I seem to be aligned. So it is. It is impractical. How, however, I will just tell you how I feel about it. There's several things in play. The first one is that if you read the if you read the law, mm -hmm. it makes me think that we're supposed to take action. You know, that's kind of the general tone of it, and that we would take that action in concert with um, the remaining members of the board of the school committee. That's correct. Okay? So that's, to me, very clear. Um, then you add in another piece. Look, I, there is a there is a currently active member of the school committee who can't be here tonight who is making a strong case that we do what he perceives us to do our duty. Okay, so we know we've got a person out there of standing, an elected official, that is making that request. My opinion is we've got a meeting scheduled for the 12th. Um, that gives us more than the 15 days that the charter calls for. Um, I think we, I, I, I think we've got to err on the side of what it appears the law says to do. We take that action and let those chips fall where they may. I get that it's impractical. I get that it, you know, is a you know potentially a one meeting thing a person may or may not have even a person could file for that seat I think February 12th is the date the papers have to be pulled if you're going to run a return right return. 13th return yes. okay oh, so no, 11, 12, 11th, 12th. right 12th return so you so you see what the impractical nature of this just goes on and on and on okay I mean it just uh, it just never stops but I think you got to take I think we have to take the action that's laid out that's that is the way I will vote. I'm inclined to agree with John. Can I? Yes, Elaine. I just want to make one comment, and I would fully agree that Mr. Bobbin is a member uh, of our community and of standing, and he has his opinion. He put it in writing. Um, oh, I believe that uh, myself, and I know my vice chair, who also couldn't be here tonight, um, has a, I think we're members of our board in good standing, and we have a different opinion right. than Mr. Bobbin. Right. So I just, I feel like, I, I, I the, the board, like the committee's voice was, we have a vacancy. Yeah. Um, I, and again, I just want to say, I know you're talking about the timing of the meeting. I just really want to say that I think it's essential that we do, when we do joint meetings and things, usually we collaborate to make sure that, like, this is a good date for everyone. Yeah. And we can make it. So I just, if that's going to happen, I just really want to make sure that yes. all the committee members can make that date. Yes. And that, you know, we have a financial forum coming up. Yeah. 
um, you know, there's, there's uh, a... Yeah, I mean, it, 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 I think if the board votes to have a, a joint meeting, um, it, we, we all have to make a good faith effort to uh, pick a day that we can um, uh, all, all, all come. It's either one of our meetings or one of yours. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's where you're going to at least right. have half so the people there. Can but, we? But, but ju just a second. Uh, uh, go ahead. Um, I mean, I, I, I think we've beat this dead horse. So can we as a board come to an agreement on what we're going to do? I, d I want I to say one more thing. I would too. Before one, okay. I'd like to say one more thing before we close it, Andy. The the the, the question that I have, and and, and I, I'd like Elaine uh, to to hear this, um, is is this? I I agree that the law is the law. And I agree that it's impractical. I agree that perhaps we should pursue it anyway. Um, but what's in the best interests of our of our school kids. For me personally, if we appoint somebody, um, I, I would like them to be well qualified for the job. And what impact will this well qualified person have in? in one meeting for the children. Will it be for the better, for the worse? If there's not a qualified candidate, um, someone with some educational experience, legal experience, or uh, the school committee uh, is probably best equipped to um, go over the qualifications. But, uh, um, Although I suppose we are too. Right. I, well, I, I just. But that's what the meeting would be for. Right. We don't have right. just because they apply doesn't mean we have to appoint them. Right. We just have to. Yes, right. Take the time. We didn't talk about the kids. Van Van Vanessa almost stole my thunder, but I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm gonna say it anyway. <laughs> Sorry, Ray. The um, when you get to the meeting, if you if you decide to have a meeting. Yes. There's lots of things that could happen. You could have no applicants. You could have only unqualified applicants. Um, you could have a multitude of qualified applicants that you can't agree on. Uh -huh. All of those things could possibly happen. So when, when the law says you shall appoint somebody, um, it, it's not mandatory in the sense that, um, by God, you have to sit here until uh, until you. It's not like we get white smoke with the Pope. That's right. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. You, it, it's not mandatory in that sense. Right. If you go through the process and you end up with with no applicants or only unsuitable applicants, or you can't agree on the, on the applicants, and then therefore you you don't six people can't vote for it. Yeah. Um, now that is a perfectly understandable outcome, and it's not like that it would be a violation of, of the word shop. Uh, John, you wanted to say something? I did, and that is specifically to you, Elaine. Yeah. Just because one member has an opinion that differs from yours doesn't, in my mind, discount your opinion at all. The only reason that I'm suggesting that that's a factor for me is that there is in front of us this law and there is you know uh, there's a request by one of your members to fulfill that um, yours is a more practical opinion in my opinion and I, and I don't disagree with it but I feel like I feel like we have to march through this thing and I understand where Ray's coming from and I, I want to just say to you that I'm not when I said what I said it was not being disrespectful to you or your vice chair about a difference of opinion it was simply it, it's it's form over substance for me um, so. I, I also I hope I didn't offend the board by saying that the school committee is the most qualified to determine if their candidate is qualified obviously we're not stupid either but so, well, um, the process allows so us to participate can, I think we need to get to a motion so do we uh, Bob point of clarification do we need a motion to 
proceed with the appointment. I think we can just agree to scheduling. You, you need to let staff know whether we want to post the vacancy, certainly. So I think that's probably all the thing. You know, okay, so we don't need to. Are we in agreement that we need to post the vacancy? And John and I have been very clear on where we stand. Yes. Yeah, if I may. Bear? I, I, I think it's a charade, but um, if that's the law, that's the law. So. So I, I don't think it's a charade. I'm, I'm, I'm angry with you and John for, for, for uh, arguing well. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and that I wasn't able to uh, argue better. Uh, so I, is that I, a reluctant yes? That is a reluctant yes. <laughs> okay. So I think, Bob, is this sufficient instruction for you? Yeah. Okay. Um, and thank you, Ray, for your input. And I will inquire with school committee members as to their availability. And the same with you. I'll just list out a lot of dates. Both of you are scheduled to meet, and we'll see what happens. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ray. Uh, Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Thanks to the board for uh, going through this. Uh, we spent a lot of time on it, but I, I think we'll continue to spend more time on it. We will, but I think it's time. It was time well well spent. We were going to miss. Well, everyone had to be heard, Barry. No, no, everyone, no we we heard. So, so we we we're. I think we've uh, blown past everything, uh, and Bob. The, the, the paper map yep. um, it does not need any motions. If the board wants me to discuss it, I'm happy to. I wrote up in your packet an overview I, and I, I read it. Town meeting information. And I don't. All have you any, need to do is sign that. Again, no votes required. I don't have any questions. Any we questions? have to use black pen, right? In the, in the, Got it. Yeah. Pen's coming with it. <laughs> Please don't mess it up. There's two, right? Yeah. And as we sign, can I move on to the Certainly. minutes? Um, the agenda only had us going over this December 11th, mm -hmm. 2018. Yeah. There, were, there were two sets I, in there. There's two sets in there. But only one is on the agenda. And I didn't review the second set because They're I, in your packet. I know. Okay. Um, well, but but I, I, I go by the agenda. And, and um, I'm, I'm not sure. Is this really set? Um, yes. Um, First question. Approval date right, right here, right? What? It's today's date? Yeah, today's date. Yeah, that's it. There. So these slides right here. So this is date. January 22nd? Yes. Correct. What, pa what page of the minutes do I on? Uh, on, on the PDF. 6A1, I think. Yeah, but like what page on the... Um, oh, okay. I put it in a minute. Oh, wait. I think it's... 185? No. 184. So are we doing 18 or are we doing... We're doing the one that's on the agenda, which is 1211. Are we doing that right now? Yes. Um, so on the first one, mm -hmm. page one. Yes. Um, we um, uh, on liaison reports. Mr. Freeman let the board know that Elaine Webb and Mark Doxer will be joining the ad hoc. It's actually Linda Snow Doxer. Right. And I and I do you, yeah. That's what happens when you don't show up to a meeting. You get yeah. Right. Right. I thought you had the wrong Doxer. Um, I, w I didn't have a chance to review the tape, Barry, but that was, um, I, I, I believe you reported that because it's your subcommittee and, and Vanessa's subcommittee. I don't know. I don't, I, I don't remember reporting that because I don't. Unless you it wasn't. I can go back and check. The, 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 the tape, yeah, I had trouble finding the tape. Um, okay. Yeah, this but then hidden. For some reason, it doesn't show up. At the I found it. I got I it. Did, I did yeah. Go yeah. Ask for it. Same that. here. Is that the 11th? Yeah. 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 It doesn't yeah. show up with the regular ones, but it is on there. Uh, but I haven't figured out exactly where, but I have a link that I have a, just click on. That's what yeah. I had to do, too. Can, can you send the board that link so we all have it? Mm -hmm. um, for thanks. the video? Yeah, the video. Yeah. I, I, I mean, we're going to improve the minutes, I think. Um, so I had the same comment. Yep. 
Um, <laughs> If you want to put my name instead of yours, that's fine. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I, don't I said it I, yeah. because it's it, I'm not on the subcommittee. Yeah, but like usually there's all usually some of us. I mean, usually all of us have something to say on this, but yeah, uh, whatever. Yeah. But it, just to be clear that you know, while it's a public meeting and Mr. Doctor Canada, exactly. <laughs> he won't yes. be sitting at the table yes. with his wife. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yes. I only had one minor edit, which is mm -hmm. 684. My name is misspelled. Oh, okay. Small potatoes. I have something on 682. Third paragraph from the bottom, by the way. Oh. Yep, there's a lot of them. That's all I have. Okay. Well, actually, did we actually even make a motion to... Did you have something else, Andy? Yeah, I did. A um, oh, motion to oh, approve the thank minutes you. of 12, 11. Uh, December 11, 2018. Someone second. Barry, you want to second? Second. 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 Okay, so, so we'll we're dis um, now we're in discussion. Um, so uh, on the on page 682, um, just after the sentence that said Eric Burkhart called the Finance Committee to order, mm -hmm. the next paragraph, um, the second sentence um, uh, that starts with without anyone seemingly agreeing, mm -hmm. um, I, I'd like to re replace it with the more neutral Mr. Friedman expressed a desire to continue discussing the motion at the next meeting in order to be able to get to other items on the evening's agenda. Um, and then the, the, the description of the, um, uh, of the motion and the, and the vote is a little different from, the, from the, the typical way we do it. I think the typical way we write it is, Mr. Friedman made a motion to postpone future discussion until January 8. Uh, the motion was seconded by Ms. Alvarado. And then um, instead of um, starting off with half the board seemingly wanted to keep hashing it out, just replace that with a simple, um, uh, Mr. Friedman made a motion. Actually, this replaces the continues off of the sentence I just said. Um, the motion was seconded by Ms. Alvarado, and then finally the board voted three to two with Ensminger and Halsey opposing. Actually, the other thing, too, in, in going forward, um, I don't think we want to use the word half the board, because that means like there's two and a half of us. Yes, yes. <laughs> and hash, so which half? We, 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 we don't okay. hash things out ever, right? Um, um, so here, uh, do, you, do you have it written for her? I do. I, I do. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, anything else? We can vote. Um, hearing no further discussion. All in favor? Okay. Um, oh, yes. Can I sign that after we adjourn, Bob? Sure. Okay. Um, would I, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn at this point. Motion to adjourn. Second. And, and, and we'll delay the discussion of select board goals okay. until okay. next time. Okay. Okay. It's just too late. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, I have to sign that thing. Yes. Yeah, we will too. Three of all, you do. All in favor? All right. Thanks. Okay. Thanks.